Right. Everybody, um, welcome. This is our Friday edition of Expo 2020, Cal State LA's first online um, senior design expo. Uh, we've got a full slate of presentations uh, in this session. Uh, we'll be going on from now until six o'clock without interruption. The um, there is a, an evaluation form. I've posted it on the group chat and I will continue to do that. There's a link to it. Uh, we encourage you to um, offer some comments and fill out the evaluation for all of the presentations that you attend. Um, the first presentation today is on the hybrid rocket propulsion unit. Um, so then without any further delay, uh, take it away team. Hello guys, uh, we are Team 12, the Hybrid Rocket Propulsion Unit, and uh, my name is Musa Abouid. Along with me are my team members, Luis Solais, Charles Herrera, James Shaw, Ruben Mendez, and Emmanuel Reyes. Our, our advisor for this project is Dr. Jeffrey S. Satner. We are sponsored by the CSULA Eagle Rocketry Team, and we'll be presenting to you today. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, in our agenda today, I'll be discussing our project background objective, along with the requirements section and how we broke down into our uh, different sectors a part of the project. My specific sector leads in the combustion chamber analysis, as well as other sectors will be talked about uh, in the future slides. Our main project background discusses uh, manufacturing and building a hybrid rocket that has um, uh, two different propellants and um, being utilized. Um, the fuel is a solid while the oxidizer is a liquid and it's being injected into our rocket. The figure above shows a solid conventional rocket, which is the most common or popular type of rocket utilized in uh, the ro rocket industry. Um, the reason for us utilizing a, uh, a hybrid rocket is that some advantages include a higher factor of safety where the fuel is separated from the, uh, from the oxidizer tank and the fuel grain are separated um, and it's controllable in terms of thrust. So you could have a pre-pressurized oxidizer tank to give a certain amount of thrust to, and, um, to the chamber which ignites and uh, determines a certain amount of thrust to achieve your goal. Our objective is to design, manufacture, and optimize a hybrid rocket. This will be held in competition in the, in the Intercollegiate Rocket Engineering Competition in New Mexico. Um, unfortunately, it's been canceled, but this would have been uh, used in the summer 2020 um, edition. And we, we are partnering with the CSULA Eagle Rocketry team uh, where we gather all of our information, our restraints and requirements in order for us to compete in this uh, competition. Our overall requirements, this does outline the requirements specified from the competition itself. Um, they have uh, certain policies and regulations we have to follow and no, none of them state uh, what type of rocket we could use such as a solid or a, a full liquid. We decided to go with the hybrid because we saw that to be best fit in terms of the application we're using it for to reach our goal altitude. Our launch elevation will begin in New Mexico at approximately 4,600 feet at the spaceport uh, facility. Um, our liquid oxidizer of choice is nitrous oxide or NOx for short. And it's a pre-pressurized tank held at 1,000 PSI and maintaining at saturation pressure. Our target altitude for this rocket unit must reach an elevation of 30,000 feet this is respect to the launch elevation that we will be taking off from there. Our maximum allowable total impulse set by the regulations of the competition is 9,200 pound force second as per IRC guidelines. The maximum diameter of this rocket is to be seven inches. This is because we are communicating with the fuselage team of the um, Eagle rocketry team. And so they require us to build a and a rocket engine that's capable of fitting and being properly placed inside their fuselage. The way we chose to break down um, our, our team um, requirements and the sectors that 
we see fit and how we can improve ourselves to work better is we broke it down into three control uh, sectors. The control volume of each sector would determine what is properly taking place and what are the requirements needed to achieve. We have the bulkhead. This contains the switch valve, injector plate, and the injector head. The control volume two is the combustion chamber. This deals with anything that is concerning the combustion process, thrust, the wax, and the ignition that's happening at, at certain parts in the combustion chamber. Our third sector would be our nozzle. This will indicate how uh, fast our, our rocket will achieve maximum speed along with the maximum thrust needed to propel the rocket at the goal altitude. And now I'll pass it on to Luis. He will begin to talk about the injector bulkhead system and how the atomization requirements will play a role. Hello, my name is Luis. I'm gonna talk about the requirements that we have to achieve to be able to have maximum atomization on our injector plate. So the first requirement has to do with Reynolds number, which is the, the behavior we can have from our injection from either being laminar flow or turbulent flow. And this requirement has to be greater than 4,100. Also, waiver's number, which represents how likely uh, this fluid has to, how likely this fluid will disperse into small particles. And this number has to be greater than 50. And also, Oinsner's number, where um, it represents um, how likely is this fluid to mix with our um, solid fluid, Fuel, so it has to be, it has to be greater than 0 0.001, and also the, our discharge coefficient has to be close to one. And also, we have to um, achieve uh, the maximum optimization to have maximum. Um, um, we have to optimize our injector plate to be able to create maximum atomization. Also, have to withstand high pressure from the tank and from the combustion chamber as also has to connect religiously. Next um, slide. Also, I'm gonna talk about the, the influence that the injector can influence into the, into the other components. The first um, thing that we have to look at is the combustion stability, which has to do with the spraying pattern. That way we, we, we make our holes in the, in the injector plate and the pressure drops that we have. Also, the second one will be uh, heat transfer, which has to do with the oxidizer flow and the rate on which um, heat, heat is being dissipated through the whole rocket, which is from the um, combustion chamber to the, to the nozzle. And also, um, injection elementary orifice size, which has to do with the number of orifices, the diameter, and the type of swelling we have. And this has to do with um, the factors that we had described before in the slide before. And the propellant combination, how likely is for this chemical reaction to happen to be able to create enough um, flame throughout the combustion chamber and the structure and design, which it has to do with the pressure forces we're cre creating from, the, from this um, combustion and also the structure, stress and thermal deformation. Next slide. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Charles where he's gonna talk about the computation analysis of the injector plate. Hey guys, uh, my name is Charles Herrera and I was working on the designing and analyzing of the injector plate. So we started with a blank plate that was seven inches in diameter and a quarter inch thick. The first design that we started with in last semester originally had 161 orifices at uh, 0. 0 0.6 inch diameter or a, about like 1.57 millimeters. They were set up in 16 semicircles and 10 orifices were on each semicircle. The orifices were staggered at 18 degrees. Uh, this resulted in uh, our rocket reaching a height of 45,000 feet, which was about, which is about 15,000 feet greater than we, we were expecting. Uh, the max velocity was 2,207 feet per second. And the acceleration, as seen on the right, it experienced about like 33 Gs of acceleration, which is way too much. So it acted more like a bomb more than anything else. So we went back to the drawing board 
and we came up with our second design, which uh, can be seen at right, which has a drastically reduced amount of orifices. This is our current and finalized working injector plate design. This one has 21 orifices at about 0 0.039 inches or about a millimeter in diameter. It has more of a linear pattern and we went with this more linear pattern because we didn't want a bunch of orifices grouped up in the center causing like a lot of the mass flow to go towards the center instead of it getting like an even spray pattern. And the reason we drastically reduced this is because now our acceleration came down to about three G's, which is a lot more manageable and a lot less bomb-like. This injector plate design did uh, meet the requirements that we were actually shooting for. We ended up getting to about 33,500 feet. And this is all simulated because we weren't able to manufacture or test it. Um, our max velocity ended up being about 408 meters per second, which is uh, still theoretical. It's still a little bit on the fast side, but um, there's still a lot of testing to be done on the plate before it's actually finalized. Um, the impulse was actually um, under our, under the, the cap that was laid out for us by the, um, the competition. We actually came at 3,000 uh, newton seconds under the cap. The cap was 40,960 newton seconds and we had 37,900 newton seconds. And you can see on the right, um, our burn time is about 15 seconds and we actually do exhaust all of our fuel and oxidizer. So that we, we, get, we get a simulated complete burn, which is really, really good. And I think that's it for the injector plate design. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to um, Emmanuel. He's gonna talk about a little bit more about the analysis behind the injector plate. Um, hi everyone, my name is Emmanuel and I'll be going over the analysis for the bulkhead system. Next slide. So in order to calculate our atomization um, analysis, we first need to obtain our starting parameters the number of orifices and the diameter are taken from Charles's um, second injector plate design. The mass flow rate is taken from the Python rocket trajectory code provided by our advisor. And the density, dynamic viscosity, and surface tension are taken from thermal property tables for liquid N2O at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Utilizing these parameters, we, we find that the Reynolds number is equal to 1,434,295, which satisfies our requirement of 4,100. The Weber's number comes out to 9,236,265, which is obviously greater than 50. And the honest forge number comes out to 1.297 times 10 to the negative fourth which is greater than 0 0.0001. Um, next slide. So utilizing the second injector plate design, a simulation was conducted on SolidWorks in order to um, essentially find the pressure drop across the, the system. This here shows the velocity flow simulation and its flow um, pattern as it is injected from the top, the, the top cap and pass it through the injector plate. Now, based on the simulation, we can see that the velocity actually decreases as it passes through the orifices of the plate. The initial velocity set for the top cap is 318 feet per second, and our mass flow outlet is set to 2.42 pounds per second. Um, next slide. This here shows our pressure flow trajectory um, as you can see, it's very, very similar to the velocity flow, except that we have a pretty significant pressure drop um, from, the, from the upper half of the bulkhead to the lower half of it. The pressure drop is determined to be around 638 PSI. And using this um, pressure drop, we're able to calculate for the discharge coefficient, which comes out to about 
Um, the reason why we care so much about the pressure drop across the injector plate is because essentially we want to avoid any combustion instability, um, you know, promote good mixing between the, the N2O and the paraffin wax and to um, ultimately help us achieve um, enough thr thrust to um, reach our requirements. Next slide. And now I'll be passing it off to Musa to talk about the combustion chamber analysis and design. Okay. So some of the things that we have to worry about concerning the combustion chamber, it's, it's one of the most important parts in, in terms of the control volume that it must withstand great amount of expansion ratio due to the combustion process. This will help uh, keep everything internal and uh, have the flow go uh, constant throughout the combustion process. Majority of our parts included are gonna be made out of aluminum 6061. This is provided from our sponsors and what we could obtain from the Eagle Rocketry team. On the inside, we have the, the fuel grain along with its ablative layer. Now think of it as like you putting on your coat where the coat acts like the layer of protection from you to the outside air. While everything is kept sealed inside the combustion chamber, we do have to worry about the other components. The other components that we have to worry about is the bulkhead and the nozzle. How do we design the system so it's properly fitted to um, attach all those components together? So the way we do that is a simple system using flanges and bolts. By using uh, flanges and bolts, we could secure the top of the bulkhead shown in the figure that is attached to the injector plate followed by a important part, which is the flange connector. The flange connector connects not only the bulkhead and the injector plate, but it also connects itself to the combustion chamber located at the flanges at the bottom right here. Inside the combustion chamber is an extruded view of the ablative layer and the solid fuel grain. The ablative layer has a certain millimeter thickness while the solid fuel grain is a long cylindrical tube that runs down the combustion chamber walls. Now, to understand our combustion chamber analysis, how do we know it's burning um, constantly? How do we know how fast is it burning after a certain amount of time? Well, in the previous slides, Charles has mentioned that the fuel will completely burn by 15 seconds. Uh, referencing uh, George Sutton, the ninth edition of propulsion, rocket propulsion elements, we obtained this formula which it could equate the re regression rate of fuel grain over time. Utilizing the formula above and the parameters we are given, we can conclude from the code that was given from our advisor that the fuel regression meets the certain requirements needed for us to have the correct burn time. So initially, our fuel grain was approximately 11.8 pounds, shown at the bottom of the figure here. In the, in the analysis performed from this formula and graphing it over a certain time that has the mass flow rate of the fuel, we see that after 15 seconds, the, the the mass flow rate is approximately between 10 and 12, which conclude that all of our fuel has burnt over a certain time, which validates our initial condition of having 11.8 pounds of the fuel. So another thing to worry about is how strong is this combustion chamber? Can it withstand the amount of pressures needed to have this combustion process going? A simulation done through SolidWorks held at 175 PSI has shown that the maximum uh, pressure exerted inside this chamber, or maximum stress exerted inside this chamber is around 2000 PSI, which is far, far less from the yield strength of aluminum 6061, which is at approximately 40,000 PSI. So by determining the factor of safety of 19.6, which is extremely high, uh, we concluded that the material would not yield during this um, stress simulation. Um, the reason for that could be is that the combustion chamber, it being exposed at the end to atmospheric pressure, allows it to escape all the gases from the bottom and throughout the nozzle. I'll pass it on to James where he will talk about the nozzle design, analysis, and the outline. Okay, so before going into our nozzle design, I'm going to give a quick overview of how they work. The primary function of a nozzle is to accelerate the combustion gases to supersonic speeds, which then generates thrust. 
This process is done in two sections in nozzle and is seen in the figure below. The converging, the converging and diverging section. The converging section chokes and accelerates the flow until the flow re speed reaches Mach 1 at the throat. The diverging section is necessary because it further accelerates the flow to speeds over Mach 1. The geometry of the component, the throat and exit diameter, can be found via pressure relationships uh, between the chamber pressure and exit pressure. One thing to note is that shock waves can occur in the nozzle if a certain threshold is reached, which causes property changes, including Mach reduction. Because of this, the design should not include these effects. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, with this in mind, the nozzle was designed around a chamber pressure of 175 PSI, uh, which my team obtained through combustion analysis. Our optimi optimization height was chosen to be 9,570 feet, which is the summation of the rocket's launch altitude and one half the height when the rocket stops accelerating, which is when the propellants stop combusting. The exit pressure at this corresponding height was found to be 10.31 PSI, resulting in a, an optimal expansion ratio of 2.89. The material that we chose for this component to be made out of was graphite due to its high melting point, which is around 6,000 6, Fahrenheit. Next slide. Uh, now with this outer diameter constraint and expansion ratio in mind, the throat and exit diameters turned out to be 1.441 inches and 2.45 inches. Again, this was determined from the critical pressure ratios between the chamber and atmospheric pressures and through isentropic relations. The converging and diverging angles are determined to be 45 degrees and 15 degrees for greatest efficiency. Furthermore, the component was designed to fit inside an exterior housing that will attach it to the combustion chamber. This makes it easily replaceable and will be connected via flanges and bolts. Next slide. Uh, flow, simula flow simulation was done on this component through installed works, which allowed us to input parameters such as chemical composition and inlet and outlet uh, conditions. The result is shown in this figure and indicates that the nozzle reaches Mach 1 at the throat and supersonic speeds in the diverging sections. It also indicates that the pressure the, the gas exhaust to is close to 10.31 PSI, which is our optimization pressure. All in all, this simulation matches up with our mathematically predicted behaviors. Uh, and now to conclude our presentation, I'll hand it to Ruben Mendez. Hi, I'm Ruben, and I'll be presenting our assembly and our results and some final remarks. So on our screen, you can see our completed assembly. Um, and uh, as you can see, the nozzle and the injector plate are connected to the combustion chamber using flanges. And so these flanges are put together using eight, um, eight steel socket head screws. So the flanges are connected using the socket screws and in between those flanges are O-rings so that there's a nice tight seal. Um, these screws are, um, were purchased were purchased from McMaster and they're quarter inch steel bolts and they have 70,000 and they can withstand 70,000 PSI. Next, please. So, um, so all the components are, so as I said before, they're all, um, they're all bolted together using uh, the steel bolts. And um, as you can see, there's a top and a bottom head to connect the, uh, the flanges. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I can talk about the manufacturing. Um, so about the manufacturing. So we estimated the total cost to be about $600. And we did this by, uh, by first calculating the weight of the rocket and then finding the price per, the price per uh, unit weight of aluminum 6061. Um, but this cost, of course, this cost doesn't reflect the actual cost for the materials that we bought because um, we ended up getting a donation from uh, EMJ Metals through the Eagle Rocketry team. They got a sponsor. And so this cost is a lot lower in actuality than, it, than what we're showing here. As far as the manufacturing time, um, we estimated about 60 plus hours. Um, and the way we estimated that was we talked to the makerspace and they, uh, they told us about how long it would take to manufacture each, each piece. And putting, uh, putting all that together, we came up with about 60 plus hours. Um, we didn't actually get to manufacture all that much. We were able to put in about 12 hours before um, the school was closed down. And the weight um, was determined using uh, SolidWorks. 
by inputting what kind of materials each piece was. And then SolidWorks was able to give us the total weight of 55 pounds, which by the way, doesn't include the uh, oxidizer tank. This is just the engine. Next slide, please. So finally, we get to some results to summarize the results. Um, so by using a combination of both um, Dr. Satner's code and uh, NASA's CEA um, software, we were able to get the following results. So we reached a target height of 33,449 feet when our goal was 30,000 feet. So we reached that goal. Our impulse was supposed to be lower than 9,208 pound, pounds, uh, pound seconds. And our, insult, our actual impulse was 8,521 according to the simulations. So we reached that goal. Our total burn time was 15 seconds. We didn't really have a goal for that, but we estimated previously that it would be about 10 to 15 seconds. So we got within that estimation. Um, our maximum temperature, which was calculated using NASA CEA, was about 1200 um, Kelvin or 1700 Fahrenheit. And our max velocity was 1,340 feet per second. And our acceleration was about 3.1 Gs. Can you go to the next slide, please? All right. So um, in conclusion, our team was able to successfully uh, design a rocket engine that met the specifications that our sponsors put forth. But due to unforeseen circumstances, we weren't able to manufacture and test it like we wanted to. Um, so because of that, we, were, we had to shift to a more computer focused rather than experimentally focused project. And using that, we were able to optimize and analyze uh, each of the com components. But um, moving forward, some improvements that could be made by future teams is, especially on the analysis portion, if you saw, we analyzed each portion of, uh, of the rocket in the control volume. So we had the injector plate, which we analyzed by itself, the combustion chamber, which we analyzed by itself, and the nozzle that we analyzed by itself. And we had to do that because the software couldn't uh, simulate combustion. So if future team, if they were able to simulate the entire rocket engine altogether, that would be a much more accurate uh, simulation. But despite this, with Professor, with Dr. Satner's code and with the simulations agreeing with that code, we were successfully able to uh, meet the requirements of our sponsors, Eagle Rocket G team, and it provides a foundation for future teams to build upon. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Musa for um, some final remarks. All right, guys, um, we would like to first uh, say thank you to our sponsors, the CSCLA Eagle Rocketry Team, EMJ Metals for donating and supplying us with the materials needed uh, to manufacture our rocket, and the Makerspace for supplying us with the materials and tools they ne uh, we needed for this project. I'd like to give uh, my last thanks to Dr. Jeffrey S. Sander for his ex expertise, guidance, and support throughout the entirety of this project. Um, we would like to then end off with saying thank you to everybody joining and if there's any questions or comments please let us know. If the questions you have relate to a certain sector please indicate the slide along with um, the sector itself which control volume so that way we could have a team member accurately answer your question. Okay thank you. Um, it's a very interesting presentation. We do have plenty of time for questions. Um, Who'd like to go first? Be sure and unmute your microphone. So, um, can I start? Uh, can I start off with a question? Sure. Yes. Okay. So, I'm not sure what um, page or slide this would relate to, but in your simulation models, did you ever consider the OF ratio shift? So, as the fuels consumed, the grain changes, the oxidizer to fuel ratio changes, or did you guys use um, linear models to simulate that? It's actually right here. And this was done through Charles. Um, it's right there. So Charles, would you like to answer that question? Or, cause. No, that's good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Charles. Uh, do, do, are, you, are you good with the question or? or... No, 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 yeah, I see. Okay. You guys considered it. I don't know if you see my laser pointer or not. Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, Sorry about that. 
Next, next question. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Sure. First of all, guys, uh, congratulations. It was a great presentation. And uh, my question is, uh, what's the material of the O-ring that you guys used? Because the maximum temperature you might get is can be like 1200 Kelvin. So I just want to know the material. R uh, rubber, rubber silicon. Uh, can it like hold uh, that m much temperature? Yes, it, I think the maximum temperature, it's, it's a really expensive O-ring and it's uh, made out of rubber silicon withstanding 1700 Kelvin. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's actually one of the most, it's actually that one O-ring is more expensive than all the bolts and nuts in this project. All right, thank you, Musa. Thank that. you, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I had a small question on page 25. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Um, it's your first line. Do you, do you really, are you measuring things to thousands of inches? In turn, uh, so James, this is the nozzle design? Um, for manufacturing, we probably would not be able to get that exact um, diameter, but as long as it's close to that, um, the expansion the ratio would hold and the perfect expansion condition would still be meant. What kind of tolerances would you really design for though? What would you expect to be able to manufacture? So we began manufacturing the injector plate and the top cap, and we've came to close to a thousandth of an inch because the machines we utilize in the makerspace have that certain amount of tolerance when it comes to the actual physical machining of the material. Okay. All right. Next question. Next question, Mike. Um, I like to see, I liked all the CAD and all the analysis. It was really cool. I was kind of interested in exploiting this rule about maximum impulse. So, so I'm surprised that they don't have a maximum energy rule. Is there, have, did you guys try, you know, having larger amounts of thrust at low speeds versus high speeds to see if one would get you higher? Because it seems like, it seems like if, if you use all your thrust at higher speeds, you could actually, you know, uh, expel more energy for, for uh, reaching a higher altitude. That is. So I'm guessing this is probably one run, right? Yeah. So, so could, could you tweak it maybe? I'm trying to think. Charles? Probably, because like, uh, um it, it it's 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 like really well i don't know i don't know how 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 much more we could reduce like the the orifice size because like it, it it's like such a, a it was such a drastic um it was such a drastic change going from like 160 down to uh down to 20 so i don't know how many more how much more we could go down but i mean that is something to to investigate i guess but but it, it it's really like it was really it was it was really hard to 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 finesse I don't know, for lack of a better word um, to get a like a complete burn. So but that's that is something that 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 should be explored. Maybe with maybe with different uh, maybe with different grain shapes. Cool. Um, and so what controls the what is kind of what's your best knob for controlling the rate at which the rocket the rate at which the rocket burns and can you have something that's dynamic so you could so it's something that wasn't passive to control the rate of burning so that that would be something more like a uh, a, uh, a like a gate valve that would go on in between the top plate and the actual uh, oxidizer tank but that wasn't really what we were going for uh, our job was just to get like a working model from below uh, the, the top plate below but that is something that we were talking about uh regulating it using some sort of computer control um, no, very cool. but it's it's and, that really controls yeah the um in addition yeah. um we our rocket is designed to sit on a static test fire bed in napa valley 
And um, we were told that from our sponsors that we were told the specifications of the oxidizer tank along with um, the piping and the plumbing concerning that will be regulated by the, the technicians at, held at Napa Valley. Um, we weren't told of the of the way of the control valves and all the setup will be permitted. Um, just where we're given those initial parameters. Um, the cool thing about our combustion or our rocket unit is that everything is interchangeable. So if you want to see different results by just changing the injector plate design, which is a small seven inch uh, diameter quarter inch thick disc, you could have drastic changes in all of the parameters. Because that injector plate is in, our, all of our designs and analysis are influenced from that injector plate. Cool. Yeah. So uh, that was the main key. Like that, Everything yeah. has to be interchangeable. Yeah. Very cool. Good. Good work, team. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I look, I look, oh, is there anybody else talking? Oh. Uh, you can go first. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Sure. Can I see your Software analysis part, like a simulation. Um, structure, a free model. Structure. Oh, okay. I think that was the nozzle one, right? Uh, not the nozzle rocket, the whole body analysis. The combustion you chamber. Said that, uh, you yeah. said like a 19. Safety detector was 19. 21. Slide 21. Yeah. This one. Okay. So, where's the loading coming from when you're Analyzing it, you probably apply some kind of loading. What the kind loading of loading is if you were to rotate this, if you were to rotate this piece uh, right here, mm -hmm. um, you would see that the inside, it, the the loading is exerted outward on the inner walls of the combustion chamber. So where does the loading come from? From the combustion, Physical. like what do you mean physically? So what creates the loading? Oh, uh, the expansion pressure from the combustion process. So you're talking about the thermal expansion? Yes. Okay. How about the rocket when it's shooting up? How about the pressure around the you know, rocket? Have you ever considered those pressure? Yeah, the, f the forces um, exerted, the G ratio um, mm -hmm. that's kept outside of the rocket is n not in this simulation it's not considered to be that um we only consider that the maximum pressure for are, the rocket. are you talking about like drag forces professor and drag forces not only drag for, drag is aerodynamic force but that will cause the structural loading as well here they gave me uh thanks let me see if my speaker just went dead i have to like restart it all the time it's super buggy oh uh, <laughs> bachman you're you're I knew not muted. okay Another question is that, have you considered any buckling analysis? No, only tensile. Okay, so very long structure, long and thin structure, right? Yes. It's a lot of compression going on due to the you know, expansions. And yes. you're, you're saying like, a, that's like a factor of safety 20 is a really large. I know, safety. yeah. Yes. The re yeah, the reason why is because the maximum pressure is exerted at 175 psi. An influence of that um, to add on, the mm -hmm. reason why is because of the previous simulation of the difference in the pressure drop due to the injector plate. So the, inside the injector plate, the pre-combustion chamber, there's a significant velocity and pressure drop due but then it gradually picks back up, obviously, during the combustion process happening. Okay, so another question following that questions. I probably asked you about this question when we had a, like a, our other section meeting. Have you considered any material change, material property change due to the you know, temperature? Because temperature yes. will affect all this material property. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I did. However, my answer to that mm -hmm. is that there is no current simulation that we have that will allow us to change the material property only because we have to include the fuel grain itself which some uh, softwares that we have doesn't take in consideration of the chemical composition of the fuel grain so the aluminum withstanding at higher temperatures 
um, w should withstand but has not been simulated only because due to our software extent. There is a program that does it, but it's like ten thousands of dollars. It's called Flow 3D of Rocket Propulsion, which no, I'm simulates. Just, okay, that. I'm not talking about the simulation. You, you have a temperature of the combustion chamber itself, right? Twelve hundred Kelvin. Yeah, maximum yeah. temperature, and then based on that temperature, you can find the material property, which is your yield strength at that particular temperature. We we yeah. also have uh, a thermal protective layer on the inside of the combustion chamber and that's the out uh, the uh, the ablative liner and that's going to help reduce the the heat transfer from the combustion exhaust to mm -hmm. the, the walls and the burn time is only like 12 seconds to 15 seconds so it we we didn't necessarily um have to take it into consideration until we actually did so like a, like a, a small test fire okay we need to wrap up um, it's been an interesting exchange, but uh, we've run out of time. So yeah, thank you very much, um, Hybrid Rocket Propulsion Team. Uh, very interesting presentation and obviously uh, a lot of interest from, from the audience, which is up about 60 people right now. So, um, well, congratulations, job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As, as a reminder, um, the uh, Qualtrics survey, uh, the link is up on the group chat. And please provide some feedback. Um, it's, it's important for, um, uh, for everyone. OK. Our next presentation is uh, the solar shower team. Who's going to be driving the charts for that? Bandar, Miguel, Catherine, Israel? Um, that'll be uh, Catherine. OK. So um, without further delay, <laughs> we welcome the solar shower team. Our advisor is Dr. Oh, we don't hear you, Catherine. Hello? Yeah. OK. So we are the solar ah. shower team. Is that an echo? You've got two different logins. Oh, yeah, I do. You one of them. <laughs> okay. Can we still hear you, Catherine? Catherine, do you hear? Do you yeah. Hear it? yeah. Okay. That's better. Okay. Okay, so we are the Solar Share team, number 38. Our advisor is Dr. Sam Landsberger, and our liaison is Sam Coe. Um, our team consists of Bandar Al Johani, Miguel Bernal, Israel Rodriguez, and myself, Captain Bell. Same thing. Same thing. I just didn't try. Yeah, Hello? Oh. Um, so, as we all know, there has been an increase in homeless um, community throughout LA, and as of January, there are 59,000 people um, living on the streets. And surprisingly, the greatest wish that they want is to take a shower. So, thanks to Pastor Sam, our liaison, and the local El Sereno Church, um, they developed a mobile shower system, which you can see you can see here. Uh, that gentleman right there is actually our liaison, and circled right there is the initial mobile shower system and what it was. So 
the problem was it was quite inefficient. So they had to keep refilling that bag with water. And because of inefficiency, they moved on to have that shower system within a trailer, as you can see right here. And right here is just a simple schematic of what it looks like. Um, it's powered up by a pump coming from the water tank going into the heater, which is heated by the propane tank and out goes to the shower head. So ultimately what we're gonna do is we want to employ water, employ um, to power both the water delivery system and heat the water. So the way we're gonna do the, the propane is we're gonna preheat the water before it goes into the heater that relies that lies in the in in the trailer. So essentially, we're going to be making like an eco-friendly kind of uh, eco-friendly kind of um, water delivery system. So plus that, um, we plan on increasing the showers to eight to ten people, and considering that they roughly take three hours to um, give showers to their clients. We want to produce at least eight showers. Um, this right here is what our system looks like. We're gonna be having a 65 gallon tank within it, which is compressed with this air tank. We're gonna be applying um, uh, compressed air within our system. And it's gonna be going up to the top of the trailer where it's going to be heated by the sun and it's going to go back down to the heater relying into uh, the trailer and then out to the shower to the side right here. And then this is a simple schematic of what uh, our system is. As you can see right here it goes from cold water in to the storage tank coming out and it splits. Um, this is just going to act as the cold water going to the tempering valve and then the other one is the other path is going to be heating before it goes to the heater and then it's going to mix together um, to the liking of our clients. Lastly, um, this, uh, this system is powered by a solar panel which is um, going to be um, powering this battery. Uh, that's ultimately going to be charging an air compressor uh, for this air tank. So from this air tank, um, we have a pressure regulator that's going to be set at 5 psi. And where this um, storage tank is, where the storage tank is ultimately going to be at 5 psi. So going to the nitty gritty of this system, first is going to be Miguel, who's going over the fluid losses. Um, using the fluid losses and energy equation, he's going to find um, the amount of pressure needed in our storage tank in order to flow throughout the system, considering a low flow shower head. After him is going to be Israel, who is going to be talking about the amount of heat transfer going into the box and the temperature that is going out to the heater. So the preheated temperature is going there. Next is going to be Bandar, who's going over the structural integrity. Um, our heater box that is on top of the trailer is roughly around 400 pounds. So the gravity, the center of gravity is going to change and we want to know when he's turning around the corner or turning a corner. Um, we want to know if this trailer is going to tip or not. And lastly, I'm going to be going over the stress analysis of the heater box, primarily um, the plate, uh, the glass plate that lies on top of it and um, answering whether our power inverter can handle the load of, um, of the air compressor and how long it would take the battery to uh, how long it would take the battery to charge up again with this one. So once again, uh, here's Miguel. Fluid, uh, here's Miguel introducing uh, the fluid losses. Good afternoon, everyone. So okay, uh, okay so. The, the main question that I, that we wanted to answer is how much, what pressure should uh, should the air inside the tank have at a specified height to be able to provide the system with a minimum of two gallons per minute? And as you see on the right, that's a rough sketch of our how our system would be. 
And then some important uh, parameters are that uh, the tubing is, is a smooth tubing on the inside and it's half inch diameter. And then the total length of the tubing shown in the diagram is about roughly 13 feet. And the height difference between the top of the water level and then the, where the shower head is, is like about 5.5 feet. So in order to uh, answer this question, I'm gonna employ the energy equation that you see at the bottom. And then we go next slide. Please. So you see that the term on the right hand of the equation that has to do with losses is composed of two terms, which is the major losses that are associated with friction. And then the minor losses, which are associated with inefficiencies as the fluid changes directions and, you know. So um, the first term and the last term, this is called major losses and it's defined as you see there by where it's, it's kind of, it's proportional to the, squ the velocity squared of the fluid and then uh, a constant called the Darcy friction factor that normally that factor depends on the Reynolds number um, and then also on the, on, the, on the roughness of the pipe. But in our case, since it's a smooth pipe, we could use the accepted formula shown in, as in blue uh, and that, that gives us the friction factor for a particular um, Reynolds number. And uh, below is just a sample calculation. And then the diagram on the right, it shows the lengths of the, of the tubing. So as you see that from the white connectors, like the incoming velocity is V naught. And then since the, it splits into the diameter all around the system, it's half an inch. So you could just assume that the, in each branch, the velocity is uh, half of the incoming velocity. And knowing that, uh, at the bottom you see the, the calculated um, head loss, which is roughly 1.56 feet. Next slide, please. So minor losses, like as I mentioned previously, they have to do with uh, the inefficiencies, the uh, energy lost when the fluid is changing direction or even cross-section, right? So in general, they could be written in that term where it's, it's proportional again to the square of the velocity and then the, the constant K, which is the minor loss coefficient, it, it's, it's, um, it's very um, experimental and it's dependent. It's usually public values from like uh, manufacturers and it's based on experimental data. So next slide, please. So, so in itself, to get the minor losses, you have to add up, as you see in the mathematical formulation, it's basically the the losses do at the inlets and the outlets, and then the losses do at the elbows, and then the loss do in the heater. So in the in the schematic you see on the right, the rightmost schematic, I highlighted the points where at those points there's the inlet of the bag and then outlet of the bag because there's four bags. This is like the bottom view of our solar box. And then on the other schematic you see the, the inlet like as the water flows out of the water tank and then when it suddenly expands and the shower head. And so to get the, uh, the loss coefficients, this is um, reference from our textbook uh, for sudden expansion and then sudden contraction. And then just um, plugging the numbers in, you get the, the head loss to at the inlet is about 0.265 feet. Next slide, please. After, next slide, please. That is the next slide. Oh, sorry. So my losses do the T's. So again, I, this is the bottom of our box. And you see that the, the flow separates and joins, right? And then, so in order to get the, the loss coefficients, we, we uh, reference a book that's mentioned in the slide, the Fundamentals of Pipe Flow. And it had a formula, depending on whether it was joining or, or uh, separating flow. And using the, those formulas, we were able to obtain those values for K. And then again, using the relation, the V squared over the, because I wanted to point out that the velocity that you use is the incoming, the incoming branch velocity. So if you see in the bottom rightmost, the little red box, the velocity incoming right there is V naught. And then as you travel along um, the, on the left side of the branch, the incoming velocity is V naught over two. So that's, and then you just add um, the head losses for those two, as you see in the formula and then you get uh, that amount of head loss in the T's. Next slide, please. And then the minor losses due to elbows in there. See, this the, the, this is the bottom of the box. So where I highlighted the, those two, well, one of the squares is out of place, but 
where basically whenever the water goes up and then it's going into the bag, there's an elbow there. And then when it comes out, there's another elbow. So in general, there's two elbows that to consider. And then that's why, and then citing the, the K factor for elbows, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of small to see, but it, it's in the, from our text, it's around two. I mean, it is two. And then using that value, we get a, the head loss due to the elbows. Next slide, please. The, the, this is a, a point that's a very, so the minor head loss due to the heater, it, it wasn't, we weren't able to get our exact for our heater. We tried to contact the manufacturer, but we weren't able to get a value specifically. So I was able to find this uh, pressure loss curve online for a similar heater. And then you can see that the pressure loss, I mean, the pressure loss in terms of head, it varies as a function of the flow rate. So just from the from that chart, I estimate that the uh, pressure loss in terms of head um, is about roughly seven feet. So going back to the original question of how much pressure is needed, we see that we see that the minor loss terms, you could add them up like for each um, component, and then you you so when you add up all the losses together, you get nine point zero three um, total loss like in terms of head, and you plug that back into the energy equation, and we solve for uh, that the pressure inside the tank should be at 6.4 PSI. One important note here is that I calculated the, in, the inlet pressure at the, when the water is going into a solar heating box, and then um, it's calculated to be 3.3 feet. And this is important because this is the pressure that the glass uh, that our um, polycarbonate sheet was gonna experience. Um, but uh, one important consideration also is that, as can be seen, the, the major uh, component that increases the, the losses is basically the, the heater. And that was, I mean, it was uh, estimated. So that's just, just for consideration. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Israel, and I'll be talking about uh, the box that we created. Um, next. So this is our box that we created that's going to be containing the uh, uh, gallons of water. Uh, for example, it, it, this uh, box is by four feet by four feet, and it's made usually by wood. Uh, each, as you can see, we have these four solar, uh, we have these four shower bags that will contain the water. Each of these bags can like contain about 10 gallons of water. And uh, also, as you can see, we also put on top of what's called a polycarbonate glass. And uh, mo most of our heat transfer due to, we're, one of the assumptions we made is that uh, the heat transfer due to the convection and conduct conduction is negligible because uh, convection, because we're, we're, we're assuming that the whole box is fully uh, sealed. And also, uh, uh, we also considering that the conduction is negligible because the uh, thermal conductivity of the wood is very small. So our goal is to actually uh, see our, the rate of heat transfer of our, si our, of our system gain. So most of our, so go next, Catherine. So as, as you can see, um, yeah, so most of the heat flux due to, to the sun hitting on the atmosphere is around uh, 1,373 uh, watts per meter squared. And not everything gets on the surface of the earth. So uh, the average in, in, Los, in Los Angeles of uh, the, the, the flux reaching on, on the earth is, uh, surface of the earth is usually around 850 uh, watts per meter squared. So from here, we could do our calculations of how much, uh, uh, what's it called? Heat, the rate of heat transfer is going into our, our water that it's in the box and we did, as you can see, we did the rate of heat transfer of solar and surroundings, and there are about 1,263 watts and 629 watts, respectively. Go next. Um, and since we also added this uh, glass on top, it has a transmissivity of 0.85. So pretty much 85% of the uh, rate of heat transfer uh, due to the solar and surroundings is going to go inside of the water. So technically, our rate of heat transfer going into our system is around 1,608. 
And also uh, water will be emitting radiation too. So we took that into account and that is our, our rate of heat transfer due, due to the water. And it's about 619 watts. And so from there, we can see that in our system, um, uh, the rate heat transfer going into our system is a lot greater than, the, than what's coming out. So we can say that it's, it's gaining energy. So we can find our, our net rate of heat transfer going in, of the box of the system and it's around 989 watts. So pretty much what's gonna be happening uh, with, our, uh, with Sam Kuo, uh, he's gonna be pretty much uh, preparing the water from 7 a.m. Um, and to 10, 10 a.m. Um, he's gonna be filling up the gallon of water in our box uh, around 40 gallons and for the tank, 65 gallons. Uh, and also our, he, our plan is to heat the water from 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so next. So from right here, we can find the, how much time it would take to heat up the water before, uh, before the shower starts. So before actually heading to the, to the homeless shelter. And so we took calculations of that. And so we first found the mass flow rate of the, of the system, which, which, uh, which was around 0 0.0170. And from there, we we're able to find the gallons per minute we can get from that, which is uh, roughly around 0 0.2 uh, gallons per minute. And then from there, we can find the time it would take for 40 gallons to be heated from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 90. And it's around four hours. And this is just with the box with, as you can see on, on the right side, um, but to, to uh, uh, no, no. So as you can see, it takes around four hours and to increase, to actually make the heating a lot faster, meaning decrease the hours a lot less, we decided to actually add the reflectors. So next, Catherine. Yeah. So right here, as we can see, we added these four reflectors that will uh, pretty much uh, reflect most of the sunlight into the into the uh, into the system, which contains the water. And for mass, uh, sorry, mass flow rate, we got 0 0.2, 0 0.0295 kilograms per second. And and for and from there, we converted to um, the flow rate, which is 0 0.4. And from there, we can find our how much it would take to uh, heat up the water from 70 degrees to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about almost two hours. So it's a lot faster. So our goal right here is to actually provide eight showers. Um, and, you know, it, we're assuming that w one person takes about three gallons to take a shower. So in total of gallons that's going to be used is around 104 gallons. And also uh, we're assuming that each person takes about 20 minutes per shower. And so the amount of time it would take for, for the whole shower to, to take is, is around three hours. And then from there, um, uh, so usually at the homeless shelter, there's like around, you know, it's pretty much 65 gallons of the tank that needs to pre, pretty much going out to take showers, right? At 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the amount of uh, gallons per minute is around, 0 0.35 gallons per minute for for three hours and so pretty much as we can see that this is our effective flow um flow rate that it would take to take the to to deliver eight showers uh, in three hours and also um it's almost it's about this the same amount of that um is the same amount that we got the, uh, to get what what was added to the when we added the reflectors uh, to increase the the water in from twenty from seventy degrees to ninety degrees. Also, we also noticed that adding the reflectors uh, uh, reduces the time to heat the water, and that's pretty much it. Now, Bandar will be talking about the structure and theory. Um, hello, everyone. So I will go over first uh, the trailer dimensions. 
So first of all, uh, here a picture on the left side, which with the actual trailer of, of Sam Co. Uh, and on the right side uh, here is a solid work uh, dimension. So basically the length is around uh, 174 inches and the width is around 72 inches and the height is around 80 inches. Next slide, please. First of all, we, uh, here is the T beam inside of the trailer. Uh, so we did like a stress analysis, uh, assuming 100 gallon tank on top of the trailer. Uh, so we got uh, the results, which is uh, structurally sound. And here uh, a screenshot of the uh, simulation. Next slide, please. So first of all, uh, stability. Uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, here is a picture of the heating box on the right side and uh, the storage tank, which is 65 gallon. So basically, uh, we want to make sure the trailer will be stable when it has heavy loads, such as those two. Uh, so the, the heating box uh, with weights around 400 pounds and the 65 gallon uh, storage tank, it weights uh, around 545 pounds. Next slide, please. And uh, here a free body diagram of the, of the trailer. Uh, as you can see, it has uh, 400 loads in the first arrow, and uh, it has uh, uh, the, the 1,280 bound, that's the empty weight of the trailer, and the one inside, which is the storage tank, the 65 gallon, which is around 545 uh, pound, and uh, we applied uh, the uh, center of gravity uh, equation. Uh, we got a number on 4.14 feet, uh, 4 feet, and after that, the force equal MA, uh, mass uh, acceleration. Then uh, oh, we got the number around 7,800, uh, 7,088.2 uh, bound per feet. Next slide. So first of all, uh, the tipping over. So uh, as you can see uh, for the free body diagram, you can see the this is a view from rear turning to the right side and with the height of the center gravity and we are uh, taking moment about g if weight total uh, if weight total uh, multiply width is over center gravitational force uh, multiply height of uh, center gravity so moment due to the center gravity force uh, equal moment due to, to the normal force uh, and we will come up with uh, this uh, equation, which is velocity, uh, square root width, multiply radius, multiply gravity over center of gravity. And this equation, we'll use it later to get out the, uh, the safety, uh, factor safety uh, in the next slide. So the facts, the factor safety against tipping, uh, this table is from roadway design manual, and this is shows the uh, speed and the radius. So in this case, I chose uh, uh, minimum speed just to see, and uh, I was assuming the, the E is zero, and as you can see in the red, uh, in the red uh, color uh, down there is uh, 47, which is the radius. And after applying the, the equations, uh, uh, we got a number uh, fact of safety of 1.5. And here another one with the same thing, uh, but uh, with the velocity of 35 mile per hour inside the city. And uh, we got uh, a fact of safety of uh, 2.1. And here, this table is uh, kind of different because it's uh, from, uh, this is uh, actually from the speed highways and uh, uh, the design speed is around 45 and the radius is around uh, 810. And after uh, applying the equation, uh, we got a factor of safety of 2.1. Next slide. And here, Catherine will go over the stress analysis of a blade. All right, so considering that there's an internal pressure of five PSI um, in the box, we need to know what kind of thickness the window needs to be. 
So this right here is our lectin plate or our polycarbonate plate. It's being held down by these aluminum bars, which create these four 24 by 24 inch windows. And across this single window, um, we're going to be doing uh, stress analysis, which is seen right there. It's all fixed edges. Again, our dimensions are 24 by 24 inches with a PSI of, um, with a pressure of five PSI. And we're going to assume that the thickness is half an inch. Okay, so for this analysis, we're going to be using Roche and Young's constitutive equations. And these are used because one, uh, all the edges are fixed. It's a plate and there's uniform force uh, placed on it. Looking at the table, we can see that we're going to be using um, the dimension, uh, these values right here. Um, that is because the dimensions are one because it's a square. So using these equations, um, we get these values seen right here where the normal max stress is 1,597 PSI. Using that value, you can find the thickness, which happens to be half an inch. So when the internal load is 5 PSI, the thickness needs to be half an inch in order for it to be safe. And knowing that, you can find the um, max deflection, which is also half an inch with a factor safety of 5. So considering that it is such a high factor of safety, um, I kind of want to explain like why we chose half an inch. And by doing so, um, I'm going to go over the same kind of plate, but a different thickness. It's actually smaller, which is three eighths of an inch seen right here on the right. Um, the, max, the normal max deflection is 2,839 PSI with, oh, sorry, the max, um, the normal max stress is 2,839 PSI. Um, the max deflection is one inch and with a factor of safety of three. So as you can see, this is also safe. However, we need to look at the percent bulge and compare the two. So for the three eighths inch, it's actually a larger value of um, four percent bulge, while the half inch is two percent. So since we know this part of the system is gonna be exposed to the elements um, light is going to be entering into the system and degrading it. We want to make sure that um, it is stable and um, that, is, that is strong enough to um, withstand that. So therefore we came up, uh, we came to use the thickness of um, half an inch. And along our calculations, we also did a simulation of the plate. Um, right here on the left, you can see the factor of safety um, normal max stress and max deflection. And for the table, you can just compare the values. You can see that they're roughly the same. So it means like probably, yeah, the values are just roughly the same. So considering the power, you want to know if the inverter can handle the load of the compressor. And simply, um, we can say that it can, knowing that the factor of safety is 14 where the total energy of the battery is 2,160 kilojoules um, and the total energy of the compressor is 146 kilojoules. And then lastly, uh, we would also want to know how long is this battery going to take after it has charged the um, charge for the compression uh, into the, the air compressor. And um, according to theory, it is known to be half an hour. However, um, the efficiency of a solar panel is 50%. Therefore, um, it's going to take about one hour to charge. And this is just a brief overview of what we learned throughout the throughout our project for fluid loss. Um, it requires five psi of the tank in order to water the flow, um, considering a low flow shower head. Um, for heat transfer, we know that 90%, around 90 degrees Fahrenheit is be coming out of that um, heater box. To, and for structural integrity, there's a total of 850 pounds um, that we know that the trailer would be safe. For the stress analysis of the window, um, the thickness is going to be half an inch considering uh, the internal load of 5 psi, the dimensions, and the plate mechanical properties. And lastly, for the power, um, the inverter can handle the compressor and it's going to take about one hour to charge uh, the battery after it has um, compressed. After it uses energy 
to compress the air. Lastly, we'd like to just say a big thank you to our advisor, Dr. Sam Landsberger, for helping us along the way, and our liaison, Sam Co, for giving us this opportunity to um, contribute back to the community. And that is it. Thank you for listening. We are the Solar Share team. Um, do you guys have any questions? Thank you, team. Um, we we uh, do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, who would like to go first? Um, I have a question. Could you remind me where the wastewater goes in your design? Okay, so the wastewater is actually dumped into um, the drain. The products they use are natural, organic, according to them. So, okay. yeah. You're not carrying it underneath? Uh, no, we're not carrying it underneath. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. So uh, when you guys are operating your shower, at what, what um, pressure is, does the shower valve require and, what, and the shower head? But the, uh, one of the things that I think we, we forgot to mention is that like, I think we didn't really get a chance to really test the system in itself. But we found that the, the actual heater, it, it requires a minimum pressure of 15 PSI in the inlet. But um, we weren't sure if, if we could like uh, modify it somehow to, so that that wouldn't be required. And we weren't able to get in contact with the manufacturer. And then since we didn't have time to test, uh, like we didn't really get like uh, specific, like because uh, the, the shower head, we only saw it in the beginning of the semester. And we, we didn't really go back to the church itself since. Okay, so like, do you guys think that having the, 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 the water tank at 5 PSI, charged to 5 PSI will be able to like uh, provide enough water without having the compressor go on and off constantly? I mean, well, considering, I, I would say because the, the, the compressed air tank, it holds uh, 10 gallons at 120 PSI. So that means that, I mean, sorry, um, yeah, at 120 PSI. So that means that at 5 PSI, it would be basically be like, uh, what would it be? 25 times, uh, so it'd be like 125 gallons. So basically you, it would be able to, to kind of like um, empty out a whole system at least once over. So I think, so, I mean, theoretically it should be possible uh, without like, without having the compressor to have turning, having to turn on constantly. But again, that was something we didn't really get to test like uh, in real life. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, um, I have, I have uh, one, uh, two questions, one quick one. So I noticed that there's, so you have solar panels and then you have the kind of the direct thermal heating from the sun, and there's um, there's also a gas tank. So, is is the sun doing directly, mostly directly heating the water thermally, or like what's kind of the rough percentage of those three energy sources? Uh, so, I mean, it takes a few hours, right, to heat up. Let's say from seventy to ninety. Um, so technically, it's, it's not doing all the work, but it's doing something where it's like it reduces. A little bit of what we're using for propane. That's just like saying not using the box at all. You know, like yeah, that's that's our goal to kind of minimize the amount of usage of the propane. Yeah. And then I'm kind of working some way. Oh, sorry, keep going. Oh no, I'm sorry. And then I'm kind of curious. What's so? What are kind of the the plans uh, going forward? Is there another team kind of taking over, or the mad scientist labs are kind of taking on the next next steps uh how is uh how are the what, what does it look like there well i think i think sam wants to have like uh some other team take over after us to like further investigate like actual like losses like in the actual system when it's set up and also mm -hmm. like, basically to measure like how efficient really is it gonna be at heating up the water 
because like, our, our estimations were rough, you know? You know. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Uh, I, I think it was a really cool project and I saw a lot of nice analysis and I think it would be a really great asset. So yeah, good work. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Um, yeah, and let me also thank the team and congratulate you on a job well done. Um, but it's time to move on to the next presentation. So um, our next presentation is a the UPS small package sort team. Um, everybody, don't forget that there's a Qualtrics survey for you to provide some feedback to the students about, about their presentations. Um, I just put the uh, link to it once again in the group chat room. You can find it there. Is the UPS team ready to go? Um, yeah, we're here. Okay. Um, go ahead for sharing. You can go ahead and grab the screen. Okay, All right. you're ready. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are uh, the UPS Automated Small Packages Sort Bag Handling Team. My name is Abdelaziz Laklubi, and in our group we have Alexa, Stephen, Damon, Felix, and Mario. And our advisor is Ted Nai, and UPS Liazian, Rigo, and Edwin. Next. So our agenda for, for today, I'm going to go over the programmatics, and uh, Alexa is going to talk about the electrical interface electrical system integration. Felix will be talking about the turret system mechanical integration. And uh, Damon will be talking about the back closer. Mario will be talking about the zip grip. Steven will be talking about the labeler and he will be wrapping up the presentation. Next. So uh, UPS is an American international packages delivery and supply chain management company. And uh, due to online shopping and social distancing, uh, deliveries has been increased exponentially. And uh, in this picture, we can see the left side, the facility from the outside and the facility from the inside in the right side. Next. So uh, here in this picture, we see a black conveyor belt going all the way down and uh, dropping boxes into these uh, bags hanging on tasks all the way back to back, all the way down as well. So uh, we can see the guy on the left side uh, manually uh, collecting the bags, uh, collecting the packages into these bags. And during holidays and season times, UPS has to hire more people to fulfill each station to uh, get the job done. And that's why we see uh, the needs of an automation sort packages. Next. So our project background, this is the 50 year generation of the UPS automated small sort packages. So this year focuses on the bag handling mechanism. So UPS automated small packages is divided into three groups, system control, bag restocking, and uh, we are the bag handling team. Next, problem and scope. The mission of our system is to design a machine that can autonomously uh, and efficiently sort small packages. And the scope of our system is responsible of correcting the positioning, uh, positioning of a bag, opening the bag, closing a bag, and removing the bag from the task into the conveyor belt how to take it to the delivery. And in this slide, we have the, present, uh, the pro uh, project organization. So uh, the project manager is Mario, and uh, our advisor is Ted, and we are uh, uh, sponsored by the UPS, uh, where we have the UPS Liazian, Edwin Arrigo, and uh, financial uh, business from UPS is uh, Evelyn, and we, divided the uh, project uh, between all of us. So myself and Alexa, we had the electrical interface. 
Felix uh, had the mechanical interface. Damon was uh, in charge of the back closing. Mario had the zip grip and Stephen had the labeler. Next. So uh, deliverables, we had uh, created prototype for each mechanism, bag opening, bag closing, bag zipping, and bag grip, and uh, bag labeler as well. And we've submitted our uh, final design review packages on May 1st. Next. A project progression. This uh, project has been under construction for four years. And in the top, we have um, year one design, year two design, and three and four year. And in the bottom, we can see our final design, uh, year five. Next. Requirements of our system, the requirement of the object, the bag weight should be 70 pounds. The operation system, the operation time of our system should be less than two minutes. The operation voltage, 5, 12, 24 volts. The back clearance from the ground should be two inches. And operation pressure is 120 PSI. Weight of all mechanism combined is 110 pounds. And the dimension of our turret is uh, 30 inch times 15 times 15. Next. And in this slide, we can see a pretty good picture of our uh, combined mechanism all together. When is the back closer followed by the zip grip and then followed by the grip where it grips the bag, then take it to the labeler to label the bag and then into the conveyor belt. And then uh, I'm going to pass it to uh, Alexa to talk about her part. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Azus. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Alexa, and I'll be talking about the electrical integration of our system. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to introduce this block diagram. Uh, this block diagram represents the general electrical layout of each of our mechanisms. So just to go into more detail about that, I'll begin with the power supply on our box block diagram. Our power supply will be giving power to our PLC or, or, prog or our programmable logic controller. And from the PLC, it will be giving commands to our microcontroller. And the microcontroller that we're using for our, our project is an Arduino. And from the microcontroller, it will be giving commands to our motors, which will be driving our mechanisms. And our microcontroller will also be giving commands to our sensors as well. Our next slide. Uh, so next, I'll be talking about the integration of our test bed. So our electrical team designed this test bed essentially to test Arduino code that can be implemented into our actual structure. Uh, so the main components in our test bed are our DC motor, our solenoid, and our limit switches. Uh, so uh, these components are frequently used within our, our structure uh, with our mechanisms. So the beneficial thing about this test bed is that it can be used to uh, test uh, programs that the students want to use into the actual structure. And so a good example of this is that um, if a student wants to control uh, the specific speed of the DC motor, they can do that with the Arduino. Uh, next slide. And now going into the logistics of the test bed, I have created an electrical schematic of all of the test bed components with its respective wiring Arduino pins and the wires as well. And I've also made a legend to indicate what the uh, colors represent. Uh, so I'll get uh, into detail about that. Uh, so the red wiring is the positive terminals, uh, the dark gray is the negative terminals, and all the other colors such as the green, blue, yellow, orange, and purple are indicated as signal pins that they're going to the Arduino. So now I'll be getting into the uh, general logistics of the motor and the solenoid. Uh, so our DC motor did need a, an input of 12 volts to uh, power on, and the current drawn from the DC motor is 0.001 milliamps. It actually fluctuated as I measured this. I used a multimeter to measure the uh, current as well. So um, at most it would draw 0.00 milliamps, which is a small current draw. And moving on to the solenoid, uh, the solenoid did need an input of 24 volts to turn on. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to do any further testing on the solenoid because 
I didn't have a resource to uh, a 24 volt power supply, I'd usually use the one on campus. Uh, so I was able to uh, focus more on the DC motor. And for the DC motor, I used a 12 volt battery to power it. And uh, now getting into the total lines of Arduino code, uh, for both the DC motor and the solenoid, it used a total of 136 lines. Uh, next slide. Uh, so now getting into how I was able to uh, test the components on the test set. Uh, here is the solenoid. Uh, the solenoid is uh, used uh, in our structure, such as our bag labeler. Um, the bag labeler is attached to the actuator. So uh, what I did on the test bed is that I used a DC relay module to turn the solenoid on and off. And next slide. And uh, for the DC motor, um, one way that the DC motor is used within our structure is on our turret. So as you can see, uh, see on the top right photo, the DC motor on the turret is indicated by the magenta cylinder. Uh, so this DC motor on the turret does move the turret up and down. So that's something I tried to simulate on the DC motor from going from the base of the turret to the top point of the turret. And how I was able to indicate that was using limit switches on our test bed. Uh, so getting into the specifics of the DC motor and how I programmed it, I used an L298N motor driver that had specific pins that can control the rotation of clockwise and counterclockwise. As well as the DC motor had a built-in incremental encoder to read uh, the positions of the motor as it's turning. And so one thing that I was able to notice while testing the DC motor was that um, I tested the, the max speed, uh, which is a 90 RPM. Um, if it goes anything above 90 RPM, uh, the uh, encoder can't keep up with the DC motor. So when the DC motor is turning and the Arduino uh, monitor is reading the number of counts, then it will have a delay if it goes above 90 RPM. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a demonstration of the DC motor on the test bed. It's just a brief one. So as the DC motor is turning, the monitor is reading the counts on the encoder. And as I press the limit switch, um, the DC motor stops and the Arduino monitor stops reading. But as I press it again, it starts reading again as well. And uh, getting into the components for all of our mechanisms, uh, the um, the components that needed a motor are a bag zipper, a bag closer, our bag opener, and our turret rotational and turret translational. And for our encoder, it did need a bag zipper, bag open. Um, it did need a bag zipper, bag uh, opener, a turret rotational and turret translational. And the components that needed sensors are our bag zipper, which needed a force pad and a limit switch. And for our bag closer, it did need a limit switch, and our bag opener needed a limit switch as well. And the components that needed a motor current meter are our bag opener and our turret translation. Uh, next slide. So now I'll be passing it on to Felix. Thank you, Alexa. Good afternoon. My name is Felix, and I'll be going over the turret system mechanical integration. Now, for the turret system mechanical integration, I came up with a design for the turret. Now the turret is supposed to hold four mechanisms all at the same time. And these four mechanisms will be attached to what we call the mechanism mounts. Now these mechanism mounts are interchangeable and will be fastened to a center plate that's located in the middle of this whole system. The center plate is attached to a threaded rod, which will, which will allow all four mechanisms and the center plate to ascend and descend. Also using the red axle that's located at the top of the system, this will allow the whole system to rotate about 180 degrees in the positive and negative direction and allow the whole system to move about the y-axis as well. Next slide. As I mentioned before, the system will, will have these mechanism mounts. Now this is a standard mechanism mount that we'll be using and each mechanism mount is going to have a unique design for the whole pattern. Now these whole patterns must be respected by each individual and their mechanism and must not interfere with them. Because by interfering with one of the holes, this will disallow the mechanisms to be fastened onto the turret properly. Now, along with the mechanisms being attached to this, to the mechanism mount, uh, control box will also be attached to the mechanism mount so that the mechanism mount and the mechanism can be transported to be worked off on an off-site off site. And also this control box controls the mechanism to do the job at hand. Next slide. Here we have a turret and animation on SOLIDWORKS. And as Alexa mentioned, we have the DC motor at the bottom, which is attached to an old hat coupling. 
Now this old hat coupling is attached to the threaded rod in, as shown in the middle. And as the DC motor rotates, it will rotate the, the old hat coupling and the old hat coupling will rotate the threaded rod in the middle. As the threaded rod rotates, it will either ascend or descend all four mechanisms and the setter plate at the same time, allowing the mechanism to align properly and precisely to do the job at hand and yeah, to allow the, the mechanism to do a job at hand. Next slide. So in order for the system to work, I conducted a finite element analysis on Nastran. And as shown, all stresses are below 4,300 PSI and giving us a, major, a margin of safety of 8.3 and a maximum deflection of 0 0.57 inches. The max stress is indicated at the end on one side of the turret, which is located with the back gripper, as you will see in later slides, with a load of 70 pounds. And also the max deflection is located on the right hand, on the right picture at the bottom of the turret. Next slide. Now, right here we have our weight, our weight budget and the components to take, we took in consideration for the weight budget were the zip, the grip, the bag opener, the bag closer, the turret itself, and some harness and controllers. Now having our basic prototypes for each mechanism, we took, we got, we gather our basic weights and we gave ourselves a 5% contingency um, since we know the, how our design is going to look and it's going to weigh. And we added that weight contingency to our basic weight, giving us a total estimated weight of 95.37 pounds. And we also gave ourselves a 10% margin just because we don't know what other things we might, what other unknown variables we might add to the whole system, maybe a larger motor, maybe a larger actuator. So using that 10% margin and adding it to the 95 pounds, we got a grand total of 104 pounds and 104.9 pounds, which shows that the system meets the weight requirement. Next slide. And now I'll be passing it on to Damien. Thank you, Felix. Um, I'm going to be talking about the bag closer mechanism. So the bag closer mechanism will consist of hinges, three linear actuators with square tubings and Doors, two door sliders. Okay, so the mechanism will rotate by using the movement of linear actuator and the hinges. So once um, the, the flat plate will deploy while at 180 degrees and rotate back to 90 degrees once it's behind the bag. So the two linear actuators will push forward the mechanism and the, third, the middle uh, stated before the middle actuator is gonna rotate it. After that's completed, the two linear actuators are going to pull the mechanism back. And as you can see, this, this is my design on, on SOLIDWORKS. And I did a prototype as well, as shown below the design. I also did a um, animation on SOLIDWORKS. So as you can see, the two linear actuators are pushing the mechanism and the hinges are causing it to rotate then it's pulling it back. I also did a finite element analysis on pattern to, to uh, do a stress and deflection analysis for my mechanism. All stresses were below 1500 PSI and by calculating the factor of safety by using the yield strength of 40 KSI from um, ASM MatWeb, I was able to get, I was able to find my margin of safety to be 25.6. So I got a maximum deflection of 0 0.05 inches, which, is, which was reduced later when I added gussets and the door sliders to add more support to my mechanism. And I'm going to pass it on to Mario. He will be talking about the SIP grip. Thank you, Damien. Hello, everyone. So my name is Mario Valdez, and I'm gonna be talking about the zip and the grip mechanisms. So there are two mechanisms separate from each other. So starting off, we have the SOLIDWORKS design for the ZIP mechanism. So this design uses a 12 volt DC motor. Um, it works very similar to the turret where the DC motor rotates an old hand coupling, which in turn rotates a threaded rod. As the threaded rod rotates, it causes linear motion for the pneumatic actuator. And that linear motion is what, is what the function is for to, to, zip, to zip up the bag. So there are two pneumatic actuators in this mechanism as well. Um, one pneumatic actuator, which is seen on top, 
um, the, that's to grab the, the zipper or the bag, and then the bottom pneumatic actuator grips the bag in place while the, while the bag is being zipped. On the other side, we have the encoder. This encoder is just to give us an idea of the location of the pneumatic actuator at all times. Um, below, I have an animation. So first, you start off with gripping the zipper and the bag itself. Once those are gripped, the DC motor is powered on, rotating the old hand coupling, which in turn rotates the threaded rod. That is what causes the linear motion, which is what you were seeing. Um, it then stops with the limit switch on the end, and then it goes back to its original location. So here's the zip prototype. So this zip prototype, as I said before, uses a threaded rod to, to, to cause a linear motion. Um, below, you can see how it works. So I powered on the DC motor, which was causing the linear motion. Um, there will also be magnets implemented to the zip, to the grip of the zipper. This is just to locate the bag zipper a lot easier since it's made out of metal. Um, there will also be pressure sensors implemented to the bag, bag zip, the bag grip of the zipper. This is just to give us feedback whether or not something is being gripped and, or to whether or not see if, if it's functioning properly. So moving on, we did some bag testing for, to determine how much force is needed to zip a bag, a UPS bag. So what we came to discover was that the highest force came on the front end of the UPS bag. The highest force came out to 3.08 pounds. Bearing that in mind, I did a finite element analysis on Astran. Um, the analysis shows stresses below 680 PSI under a load of 3.08 pounds. So just to give you a bit of context, the, the material we're using is aluminum T66061, um, which has a yield strength of 40,000 PSI. So the 680 PSI comes nowhere near that. We also have a maximum deformation of 0 0.007 inches and a margin of safety of 56.8. So moving on, we have the spout work design for the bag ripper. So this, me this mechanism is a lot more simpler compared to the bag zipper. It just uses two pneumatic actuators with 3D printed clamps. Um, it has a, has a margin to lift up to 70 pounds. The 70 pounds is a worst case scenario for UPS. It, does, it rarely goes to there, but we just wanted to make sure that for any unforeseen obstacles that it can't sustain more than, than what it should. So we also added support to reduce deformation. And on the right side, I have a, a short animation of how it works. So it's very simple. It's powered on using an air supply. So air supply is poured into the pneumatic actuators, um, which turns them on or off. And then they'll also be used in solenoids to switch the actuators on and off. So here's the prototype for the bag gripper. This design uses a 1 8 aluminum square tubing with additional supports. As I said before, the additional support is just to reduce the deformation as much as possible. Um, it can hold a 70 pound bag. On the right hand side, you could see that's holding it. Um, the prototype uses um, steel, but we, the final product would be using aluminum. This is just to reduce the weight of the overall mechanisms to reduce the stress on the turret itself. Um, I also did a finite element analysis for the bag gripper. So the analysis showed that stresses were below 498 PSI under a load of 70 pounds, which is really good since 70 pounds is our worst case scenario and we're only getting 490 PSI when comparing it to the 40,000 PSI for aluminum T6061. Um, the maximum deformation for this mechanism is also 0 0.04 inches, so it's very minuscule. Um, that's also gonna be very beneficial for alignment, it's not gonna really affect it that much. And then finally, our margin of safety was 78.3. I'm gonna be moving on to Steven. Thank you, Mario. I'm Steven, I'll be introducing the labeler mechanism. So on to the next slide. We have here the labeler SOLIDWORKS design. So the purpose of the labeler is to allow UPS workers to know where packages will go by applying a shipping label onto the bags that are filled with small packages. So in the image you can see from left to right, we have the label maker that produces the label. We have a fixed blade that is responsible for tearing off the label, a actuated plate that has suction cups on the front that hold the label in place, linear ball bearings to reduce friction and prevent jamming, of the actuator, and then the pneumatic actuator itself. On to the next slide. So here we have the prototype for the labeler. Um, before, when the first semester we had the labeler, it used a slider crank mechanism attached to scissors to tear off the label, or I mean cut off the label. But learning that the labels had a perforated edge to it, we took advantage of that 
and remove <laughs> that whole mechanism itself and use the suction of the of a of a um of a vacuum pump to hold the label in place and use that fixed plate to tear off the label. We also added solenoids to improve the efficiency and used added linear ball bearings to prevent jamming of the mechanism. On to the next slide. So here we have the demonstration. This video demonstrates what one work cycle will look like for this mechanism. So the label would come out, the actuator would extend, and that fixed plate would tear off the label and eventually the, the label we placed onto the, the shipping bag that contains all the packages. And the, the uh, solenoids itself are what are responsible for having that quick response type of extending and then retracting back. On to the next slide. So I conducted to test some testing to see how much pressure it would take to tear off a label. On the left hand side, we did the test without bearings in the beginning of the semester. And we found that the pressure ranged from 60 PSI all the way to 64. This was somewhat consistent, but the mechanism itself tended to jam. So we added some bearings on the next semester. So in the figure on the right, we can see that the pressure dropped somewhat and it ranged from 58 PSI all the way to 60. But more importantly, the mechanism itself stopped jamming. And we found that the most efficient pressure to work with this mechanism was 60 PSI. Okay, on to the next slide. So I'll be wrapping up the presentation now. So to summarize, the prototypes of the mechanisms were provided. We conducted some testing to prove that our mechanisms would meet our requirements. We provided CAD designs and finite element modeling. Testbed was an electrical schematics were completed. And lastly, we would like to thank our advisor, Ted, and our liaison, Rigo and Edwin. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you, team. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, who would like to go first? Be sure and unmute your microphone. This is Kurt with UPS. I don't have any questions for the group, uh, but I wanted to say nice job and, and thank you for all of your hard work this school year. Um, I've been with this program since the first generation, so through all five years of this so far, and, and I'm really glad to see the progress of it. And I really do uh, want to say that I appreciate the modeling that you guys did, the animation, and really the building of the prototypes. That's something that I know during this circumstance that we're dealing with is rather difficult to do. But going that extra effort, I, I want to say that from me and from UPS, we do appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any questions from others in the audience? Okay. Hey, this is Rigo, and yeah, I, I, I want to echo what Kurt said, and I've been a part of uh, three years, and um, the very first couple of weeks, I, I told this team uh, after they came out with their initial design that uh, they were, at that time, far advanced in the past years, and I really thought that this year was going to be the year and uh all this pandemic stuff happened but you guys did a great job every every time we had a meeting you guys were very well prepared and um uh, even though you guys were you know distant from each other um it showed how you know the the teamwork that you guys had and and i'm proud of the uh, final product and uh nice job to everybody and uh we're looking forward to next year next year's thank a year thank you thank you, thank thank you. you. All right. So with that comment, let me then ask the team, um, what are the first things that team next year is going to need to do? What do they need to pick up on and what work needs is still remaining to be done? Um, I feel like more than anything, since we do have some prototypes already built, they can do some, they can do some testing with them. Um, that's just to give them an idea how long it takes and whether or not they can improve on that by either um, changing the motor, um, increasing the voltage to make it go faster. Because what we did um, realize with the prototype is that it did take a relatively long time to, like for, for example, for myself, it did take a long time to zip up the bag. And our goal is to meet a two minute requirement. Right now we have a three to 3.5 minute um, capability. So next year it can really 
focus on that, on whether or not changing the motor and reducing the time as much as possible. What limits the bag closure time? Is it? Uh, when, um, I did, when I did testing for the bag closure mechanisms, I had the same issue as Mario. So when I was doing, doing the testing, I used the power supply and I was changing the voltage. As I noticed that the, the, more, the more voltage it uses, the faster it went. However, I had the same issue because my mechanism would take like 30 seconds, about 30 seconds to close it and well, to, op to move forward and go back. So, yeah. Do you think you need, I mean, are you suggesting that the, um, the motor size is, is adequate and that you just need to run it faster? Or are you suggesting you might need more, more torque or more um, motor speed? What, I'm not um, sure what you think the answer is. Um, we believe the BC motor sizes are sufficient. What needs to change is essentially the voltage just to increase um, the RPM, just make them go faster. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, team. Um, thanks on a project well done. Congratulations. Um, next, next in line today is the Harbor Cleaner project. That presentation will start in about 10 minutes, but if the team is here, um, they can take control of the screen um, whenever they're ready. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. There is a form. Um, the link of, is is in the group chat for uh, the form is for purposes of providing some feedback about the presentation. Um, we encourage you to to fill that out. Um, it, it's only. It only takes a couple of minutes, it's all multiple choice. Um, but the feedback is important to the students, it's important to the program. So take a moment and fill out that Qualtrics survey while you're waiting for Harbor Cleaner to queue up. Hi, I'm, I'm looking for the Harbor Cleaner group. You found it. Okay. Hi, yeah, Ron. Hello. Hi, oh, there they are. Allison's here. <laughs> okay. You guys ought to join me at the uh, beach. <laughs> they look nice. Mm -hmm. Is Ray here? I don't see him right now. Ray's not in yet. No. Oh, okay. Um, how are you, Professor Thorburn? I'm doing great. Doing great. Um, Cassandra's in the waiting room. Should I let her in? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to miss Professor Thorburn's and our advisors. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, we could have you stick around another year. Yeah. <laughs> Please, God, no. Is this the teacher? Yeah. Please, God, look up. Sorry, my internet went down literally like a minute ago. I was like, oh. that wouldn't be a good timing. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was. Last year, I think they uh, put together a background uh, for the Harbor Cleaning. Oh, well, look at they all look so nice. Yeah. Boy, this group really cleans up nice, huh? <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, thanks, Ron. <laughs> nice background. Thank there. <laughs> we'll take we'll take just about five minutes more before we get started, just to be sure everybody that wants to see the presentation doesn't find that they've missed the first part. Sure. A bunch of people are watching. Or mm -hmm. sure. thirty-three people in the room at this moment. It'll probably grow. Has anyone a uh, Zoom bomb this section? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not intentionally, anyway. <laughs> so we've been lucky. But I've been ready to, to kick people out if they become disruptive, so. I have the master control here on my computer. Has anybody's presentation been bad enough? They just hit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Why, why would you ask that? <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> if you want us to do that, we can see there can always be a first. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, five, six, with Ray. Is everybody there? There's I one. don't see Ray. It's not five till yet. Mm. And that's what time is. I lost all here because I lost the handball. Mm. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, is Ray in the queue? I don't see Ray yet, but when I, I was actually going to send him a text message. Okay, thank you. But I'm sure he wants to be here. So for my crew, I, I'm afraid we may not have the golden in our audience. So it looks like she's pooped out. That walk this morning was too much for her. We, we had our own golden retriever that was going to be in the audience. So. Oh. To uh, Ray always says you've got to you've got to uh, cue it down so that a golden retriever can understand it. So we're going to put that to the test. <laughs> Hopefully, we pass. Yep. I'd like to remind everybody, this is Expo 2020. Um, this is our first, Cal State LA's first virtual expo. Um, we see, this is the last day of the expo, but we still have three presentations in this session. We'll be going until about six o'clock. There is a Qualtrics survey to fill out to provide students and the program some feedback. You'll find the link to that survey in your chat room. And we'll get started with the next presentation in about three minutes. Looks like people are starting to pop in. Um, who from the Harbor Cleaner team will be driving the charts? Uh, that'd be me. 
Okay, Esteban, so, you can share your screen whenever. Um, you're ready. It'll be Sosa. Oh, okay. Sosa, <coughs> you can share your screen whenever you're ready then. Um, <coughs> Ah, uh, here comes Ray. Audience has doubled in about the last two minutes. So. Wow, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think you guys get safe to get started whenever you're ready. Shall I start? Is Ray in the audience? R Ray is here. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ray. Okay. All right. I'll take it away. So, good afternoon, everyone. We are Team 73 of the Harbor Cleaner Project, and this is our Capstone Senior Design Expo presentation. Next slide, please. Our team consists of Cassandra Castaneda, myself, Allison Dizan, Edgar Sosa, Ronaldo Tani, and Esteban Villalobos. Our advisors are Ronald Sobchik and Ray Manning. Our sponsors are ECST of Cal State LA. Next slide, please. Here is our agenda for today. I'll be starting off with the background. <coughs> Marine debris is a worldwide problem. No country currently escapes this problem. For example, 8 million metric tons of plastic are thrown to the ocean every year. This is a problem as Plastic that decomposes into the ocean enters our marine ecosystem and ultimately enters us. Next slide, please. The Port of Long Beach is no exception to this problem. As we see in this photo, the Port of Long Beach is overrun with trash. As the Port of Long Beach acts as the second busiest container port and acts as the main gateway of US Asian trade, such a state is unacceptable. The Port of Long Beach needs our help. Next slide, please. The conditions at the port, namely Pier F, consists of concrete pilings with six feet spacings, 15 miles per hour winds, and waves that go up to three to five feet. The marine debris that exists at Pier F consists of mostly small trash, such as trash bags, single-use water bottles, and cigarette butts. Next slide, please. While previous solutions, such as the Big Dipper, was tried, it was proven to be insufficient the port of Long, while the Port of Long Beach currently still uses the Big Dipper, it was seen to be best for large trash, such as tires and wooden logs. Small trash, such as the trash that exists at Pier F, were considered too small and slipped, slipped from the collection, bid, collection bin of the Big Dipper. Furthermore, it was too big and could not fit into Pier F. The Port of Long Beach needs a solution suitable for Pier F. Next slide, please. Thus, our main objective is to design, develop, and deliver a remote controlled vessel frame that includes a flotation system and propulsion system while traveling approximately two miles to our trash site work area. Next slide, please. To accomplish this goal, we, we will have delivered a vessel frame, propulsion system, flotation system, and collection system by the end of the year. To achieve this, we have completed, we have, we'll have completed 25 weekly status reports and two technical reports by the end of the year. Our project has many requirements respective to each system. However, we have decided to focus on five critical requirements of our project. The team has, has met the requirements um, meant for the material, dimension, weight, and operation. However, the team was unable to test whether the, the electric motors were able to provide forwards and backwards thrust, as well as rotating on its own axis due to COVID-19. 
However, this will be, for now, it is marked to be two to be determined and will be verified by future teams. Now, without further ado, here is our final design, the gator. I will now pass it on to Ronaldo, who will talk about the frame. Thank you, Allison. Next slide, please. We will now show the 10 individual components of this vessel, where they are placed, its mechanisms, and our real-life progress. First, we start with the CAD models. Next is a video showing how it all comes together. We have the barrels and thrusters at the bottom, the conveyor at the front, arms on the side, batteries on the back, and collection near center. Next slide. The vessel frame is composed of a 60CZ3 T6 aluminum. This alloy satisfies our corrosion resistance requirement while providing a lightweight yet strong backbone to our vessel. This welded frame costs about $88 and its weight is 30 pounds. Next slide, please. We now see the real life components of this vessel. Some of, some of which were fabricated, such as the collection bin, the arms with gate, the C channels and the frame. Others were either donated purchased or borrowed, such as the barrels, batteries, and its snap-top boxes. We also see the corresponding real weights to the components. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we were not able to complete fabrication of the conveyor system, due, uh, with, yet we are confident that next year's team will be able to pick up right where we left off. Next slide, please. Our overall vessel satisfies both the size and weight requirements. Next, we will show a video showing the vessel's mechanism. Next slide, please. We have a gate that can rotate to capture and trap debris. As, as it's driving, the gate will be oriented in the parallel of the conveyor ramp. We have the arms that can extend forward and retract backward. My colleague Cassandra will tell you the purpose of this mechanism shortly. We also have stepper motor control thrusters that will provide steerable propellers. And finally, to empty and replace the collection bin, the arms will first need to extend fully and the wheels on the collection bin along with the bin guides attached to the frame will assist in rolling this bin to the side. the bin will be attached to the frame via bungee cables. Now to support the 23 arms on each side, while still allowing it to extract forward and retract backward, I was able to fabricate these C channels at home using duct tape JB Weld glue, metal coat hangers, and brass balls. If I can have your attention to my camera screen, I will demonstrate to you how they work. So as you can see, I have a prop two, clear two inch PVC diameter pipe that is able to slide forward and backward. This is due to the ability of the brass balls able to rotate freely about the metal coat hangers axis. I have a second C-channel, these two C-channels will serve as a support for the arms while still allowing it to extract forward and retract backward. Next slide, please. I now welcome Cassandra to give an overview of the flotations. Thank you, Ronaldo. When establishing what should be used for, as our flotation support system, our team considers several different options. However, we found the 55 gallon barrel system to be the most viable and cheapest option as the barrels were already donated. It should also be noted that these barrels also provide enough buoyancy force, sorry, um, and it is more than enough to support our system. The arrangement of the barrels was also considered as its orientation could affect drag and velocity. With the desire of maximizing efficiency at distance, we found the orientation shown in the bottom left corner to be the most effective. Next slide. One major aspect that was thoroughly considered was weight. The amount of weight loaded on top of the vessel would ultimately affect how tall the harbor cleaner is going to float in the water. Since we want to ensure the vessel could fit underneath the piling, our team did put together a weight table as shown. The initial approximation of what we predicted was rather conservative. 
As actual items began to be manufactured, we found the weight slowly begin to decrease, yielding approximately 330 pounds. To ensure that the vessel would still be able to fit underneath the pilings, water could simply be added to the barrels in order to weigh down the vessel, ensuring the dimensions requirement is met. Next slide. I've discussed in the previous slide how weight and sizing affect one another. Here in this slide, I would just like to mention the overall dimension of the vessel. As can be seen, this dimension satisfies the second requirement for our requirements table, where the vessel should be no larger than six foot by five foot by five foot. Next slide. I will now pass it over to Edgar to talk about propulsions. Thank you, Cassandra. So when looking at propulsion, uh, we're looking at mostly last year's 3D printed thruster housing. And what we now to, uh, have found to incorporate was pretty much by an, um, an, a separate propeller uh, with the material that is um, capable of being tested, uh, such as ABS plastic, which it's made out of, and as well as integrate a anti-fouling uh, system. So this can allow for the longevity of the use when testing and ultimately the deployment. We can see that uh, there are three options um, that we ultimately wanted to choose for maneuverability. Uh, one being the rack and pinion, uh, another being differential and thrust, and the third being separate motor control. Now, we couldn't do the rack and pinion ultimately due to time constraint and uh, due to this uh, pandemic, but as well as this would be uh, more complex to manufacture. And so we had ultimately seen that there was an easier way, which is uh, stepper motor control. Now this uh, will allow us to maneuver more easily through the pilings of the Long, port, Long Beach port and also allow for uh, less power consumption. I will now pass it on to uh, my peer, Cassandra, who will go on to collections. Next slide. So moving forward with the collection system, our team established that a 45 degree angle would be most suitable for our design as anything smaller would result in a longer overall length of the vessel. Four fins are to be added to the conveyor where the dimension of the debris is to be smaller than two feet. Lastly, to ensure that the conveyor continues to collect debris, a speed of two revolutions per minute is to be established and implemented. Next slide. Now that I've discussed the conveyor system, let us move forward and talk about how the actual vessel will operate. As we move forward through the water, the side gate system will be retracted inwards as shown in figure A. Once the vessel has reached its location and in view of debris, the side gates will begin to extend as shown in figure B. Once fully extended, the front gate will begin to rotate towards the vessel, entrapping, entrapping the debris inside the area. Once the debris has been trapped, the side gate systems will begin to slowly retract. This allows the, tra this allows the trash to move towards the conveyor where it could be picked up and loaded on top of the vessel into the collection bin. Next slide. And now I will pass it over to Esteban who will talk about the electrical portion. Hello, uh, I'm Esteban Villalobos. I'm gonna be going over the electrical system for Harbor Cleaner Project. Uh, here's the block diagram of our electrical layout. Uh, we plan on having four electrical systems. Uh, the propulsion system as seen on the left will contain three DC thrusters, three stepper motors and, uh, in order to control the speed and direction. Uh, the rail system, which will contain two stepper motors, one for the rail and one for the gate. Uh, the collection system, which is the simplest system, having just one stepper motor. Um, and finally, the communication slash control system, which will house the gyroscope XB communication system, uh, microcontroller, and uh, motor drivers. Uh, we are using four batteries, three of which will be in parallel, as you can see on the left, uh, that will be powering the propulsion system, as well as the ramp motor and slave microcontroller. Uh, the other battery will power the rest of the system. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge we had with this electrical design was trying to figure out a way to run all the motors simultaneously, uh, or running all the motors while simultaneously re receiving user inputs. Uh, so in order to code this effectively, we decided to use two TM4C123 microcontrollers. Um, and where the, uh, the slave microcontroller will be responsible for, which can be seen on the left, will be responsible for managing the motors that use electronic speed controllers or are continuously running, like the ramp motor while the master microcontroller on the right will be responsible for the gyroscope, XB communications, uh, rail system, and as well as passing along uh, commands to the slave microcontroller. 
Um, and now moving on to the next chart, it shows the interrupt cycle logic of the master microcontroller. Uh, this should give you a good understanding of the logic behind the interrupts and our main loop. Uh, the main reason for using two microcontrollers was to have one board manage all the motors that are working regularly and that would be most affected by delays caused, for, caused from user input. Um, and the other board was to manage the user input, gyroscope, and other uh, stepper motor and other stepper motors that can be uh, used in steps. Um, it begins by initializing all the timers, motors, registers, and peripheral devices, such as the XB and gyroscope. Um, it then enters the beginning of the loop. Um, here, the first uh, uh, diamond you see is a, a signal for the interrupt. So basically, if the interrupt is active, it will go take the right path, or it will take the path on the on the viewer's right, which is set equal to one. Uh, if not, it'll just continue on to the left patch, which is considered kind of the execution phase. Um, so it's going to fetch all the temporary motor variables. And then uh, um, if, assuming if there is no uh, user input, it will just move, keep moving down. It'll, um, it'll uh, check, check, uh, fetch the temporary variables and assign them to the uh, and check and map each temporary motor variable value and sends the necessary motor variables to the slave microcontroller, after which it enters its execution phase, which uh, is located off but it will, uh, it will enter that and essentially uh, process any of the gyroscope information, the stepper motors that need to be ran. Um, stepper motors, well, they, uh, they will be working in steps, so if an interrupt does occur, the steps should be, have already been taken, so the, inter the delay cost in the stepper motors will be less noticeable than if it were uh, an ESC or DC motor. Um, and now, uh, uh, and so if, it, if there was an interrupt, it would go to take the right path. Uh, for instance, on the XB communication, the interrupt flag would be enabled, and then it will just record the inputs from the XB, set them to the new current values, and then it will end the interrupt and continue the program where it left off. Uh, okay, now moving on to the power budget of our design. Uh, or sorry, I guess we're, but uh, ultimately the, the, what, why we chose the two microcontroller setup is that it allows us to run all the essential motors while simultaneously recording and storing the inputs from the user to guide the motor. Um, and on the power budget, you can see that uh, a majority of our power consumption comes from the thruster motors, as highlighted in green, and the stepper motors. Um, now, if you look at the bottom left uh, of the chart, we use three types of batteries. Uh, we have a total of 984 watt hours between them. Uh, however, the three battery pack system will be the limiting factor. So uh, we calculated the runtime uh, for we calculated the runtime for that battery pack to be run down to 15% charge. And you can see that number in the bottom right as 85 minutes of runtime. Um, this is under our expected circumstances, worst case scenario, assuming all motors are running max power the entire time, would be about 64 minutes. Um, now I'd like to hand it off to Allison to talk about the simulations. Thank you, Esteban. Ellen, I'll talk about the simulations. Next slide, please. A finite element analysis was ran on the frame to predict the stresses and the deflections the frame would experience after a number of applied forces. By setting up a static study simulation on SOLIDWORKS, Fixtures, labeled in green, were applied where the barrels are placed in respect of the frame. Then, low forces such as the weight of the batteries, arms, and conveyor belt were applied. Lastly, a gravitational load was, of 5Gs was applied to mimic whether the 15 miles per hour winds or the 3 to 5 foot waves would crash into the vessel. This was applied to the side, as shown in the red. Next slide. And to the front, as shown in the red. Next slide, please. <clears throat> By running the FEA, um, we see in the case of applying the gravitational load to the side, we see that the frame shows no frame failure, knowing that the yield strength of galvanized steel and aluminum 6063 T6 is 29,000 PSI and 31,000 PSI. We are, in good, we are in good shape as the maximum stress experienced by the frame is 11,000 PSI. This calculates to a factor of safety of 2.8. Looking closer at the, maxim, at the location of the maximum stress, we see that, as indicated in red, the maximum stress experienced by the frame is at the front of the frame near the sea channels. To alleviate this high particular stress area, we plan to add layers um, to the weld to increase the, the wall's thickness, ultimately increasing the strength. Next slide, please. The FEA showed us, also showed us that the maximum deflection experienced by the frame is 0.155 inches. How, however, this is acceptable as the arms are still, are still in functional use. Um, it is also important to note that this image is not a true image. It is merely exaggeration to show areas of inches of, of interest in the deflection. 
Next slide, please. Now, in the case of applying the, applying the gravitational load to the front, we see that the maximum stress decreases to a value of 9,000 PSI, recalculating the factor of safety to 3.3. We also see that the maximum stress location is actually moves to the bottom of the frame, but it's still in the front and next to the C channels. Again, we are considering to use doublers to alleviate this problem. Next slide, please. And lastly, the deflection recalculates to be a maximum of one point, point sorry, 0 0.132 inches deflection. Again, this is acceptable and the arms of the mechanism will still work. Next slide, please. I will now pass it on to my to my colleague Edgar, who will talk, who will conclude the presentation. Thank you, Allison. So going on, we see that um, from last year's project, uh, we see that we have integrated a new front gate uh, system, uh, composing of a set lateral moving arms that can pull in debris uh, for the collections, as well as a new type of a propulsion approach for maneuvering. So the main objectives that we had ultimately seen is a new type of vessel frame, which is now corrosion resistant, a uh, propulsion that now has an anti-fouling factor to increase the longevity of its use, and a new type of way to collect the trash and debris that is now sitting on the Long Beach floor. Uh, going on to the path forward, uh, we ultimately see that hopefully there will be a finish of fabrication for testing and ultimately launch onto the Long Beach port. Uh, we'd like to give uh, special thanks to our advisors, Ronald Sopchik and Ray Manning, uh, of course, Michael Thorburn and Christopher J. Bachman, uh, Evelyn Lee, uh, the Makerspace staff, and a special thanks to Edgar Marroquin. Okay, well, thank you, team. Um, interesting presentation. Uh, we have plenty of time for some questions. Um, who would like to go first? So can we give a round of applause to Allison, Rinaldo, Cassandra, Esteban, and Edgar for a good project and a super presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stop, yeah. on Stop on blushing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Questions? If not, let me start. Um, I had a couple of questions about the design. What's the the um, height of the center of mass above the above the vehicle, or, or where is the center of mass? I should say of the vehicle uh, at the center of the frame, and it's about two feet high. About two feet high. Mm -hmm. Did you? Oh, did okay. we want to? Did you want to go back That's from the center of mass, right? Right. <coughs> Okay. And um, were you looking something up or are you ready for the next question? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm ready for the next question. Okay. The next question I had had to do with the amount of thrust in the propulsion system. The propellers look kind of small. Do they provide adequate thrust? Have you looked at that? So for the propellers, uh, I was looking at uh, some they use those type of propellers on some YouTube videos, and they also had uh, some uh, some data on it from their um, pre-designed propellers. So they ran their own tests with that uh, design. Uh, it does actually provide. Uh, I don't. Let me see if I can get the number on here. It does provide good thrust. I believe it's about. Um, I don't have the numbers right here. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, it might be in the appendix, Edgar, if you go down to the, some of the last slides. Um, it should be one of the slides we got rid of, but um, oh. unfortunately, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, the, the thrust on it, we, we, uh, we be I believe it was this, the proper amount of thrust. I, I don't have the number. I believe it's 2.6 uh, kilograms. Uh, an inch, but let me double check. Uh, but I, uh, the main, like, uh, the main uh, motor we were comparing it to were the, were the T Hunt 100 series and the T 200 series. 
Yeah. And so we used those uh, values that they had for their uh, thrusts. And since the, this microcontroller or this this motor had uh, equivalent values to the T100, uh, we assumed that it would be strong enough for the, okay. for the vessel. But um, had you ever thought about, or I'm not sure if you guys took on any modeling of um, like with the resistance to movement because of the shape of the boat or I mean, how much thrust would be required to make the vehicle um, move um, in an effective way? I, well, it's about sizing these with the vehicle. I, I, was that an analysis that anybody did or not? So oh, yes, we had actually uh, uh, done specific configurations as we've seen um, because of the barrels themselves. Yeah. Obviously, when the propulsion system has to pull it, Obviously, it's dealing with the drag of the uh, of the right. face of the barrels. So, uh, we done uh, first uh, set of calculations to find the velocity of it using uh, one in, one barrel in the front and two in the back. And ultimately, uh, as we can see, we went with uh, two in the front and one in the back, uh, just to uh, pretty much allow that extra um, increase of width to not be. Uh, dragged uh, to the back barrel. So it would just have that front two. Uh, we'd seen that this pretty much gave us the benefit of the doubt for the configuration. Okay. All right, thank you. Other questions? I have a couple questions. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to say a very, very nice presentation, guys. That was really incredible work that you guys have done, especially with all the challenges that this semester, so I'm sure you, you're very well familiar with. So I have two questions. Um, so first, kind of serious, and the other one, a little bit more silly. Uh, so the first question I have is, um, if, has there been any, um, since you guys are kind of designing this device for a specific, you know, location in, in Long Beach, has there been any, um, I guess, observations of just how much volume of, of trash is actually in the bay? And I ask that because, you know, if, if this device were to be put into motion, you know, how many, how many trips would it need to take in order to, to collect, theoretically, all the trash in there? So we tried, we did try to go to the city of Long Beach and, and get a first-hand um, viewing. I know last year's team, they were able to go, so these are actual pictures from the pier. Can you go back? Yeah, so these are actual pictures from the pier that I believe last year's team was able to go and gather them. Um, unfortunately, this year we weren't that lucky to go check it out ourselves. Um, to piggyback on that, um, we needed security clearances and things like that to enter the pier. But um, we based off the volume of trash off of last year's pictures. I see. Nice. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So, and so the other question I have is, uh, you know, you're you're putting this device in the water. Um, and you know it's going to be you know if they're going to have parts going in and collecting the trash. Is there any risk of like uh, any sea life or anything uh, being accidentally caught into the into the into the vehicle? And uh, if so, are there any uh, anything that you guys any any adjustments that you guys would make in order to uh, account for that? Yeah. So actually, in one of our requirements table is uh, safety is about safety, and we have five signal warnings. One of them is a jamming signal, um, so that will tell us if anything is jammed. And God forbid it's a sea life, the operator would have to stop collecting. I see. Once, hey, thank once, you. Once, once he sends the gem. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this, this is Ted Nye. I got a couple of questions. Uh, really nice CAD work, guys. Uh, great design. It's really a clean presentation. I, I really liked it. Uh, I have uh, uh, just three, three questions. The, and you probably might have covered it, but I might have missed it. But the minimum size of debris that you plan to pick up, what's kind of the minimum size? Can you get cigarette butts, for instance, or do you have to get big pieces of styrofoam and plastic? So the way we design our mesh is, uh, well, we, we, we try to find the smallest, tiniest hole of mesh um, that, 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 could possibly, that, that could possibly be collected. You can see in that, you might not be able to see in that collection bin, but it's supposed to be a really tiny mesh. As far as the arms, perhaps it can escape. Uh, a cigarette butt can escape just because the orange plastic mesh that was donated to us and they don't have the tiniest holes. So we might need to incorporate a second layer of mesh just to tighten up those holes. 
Okay, that, and that might be something that comes out in testing too. You, you just yes. uh, see what it yes. can do, and maybe too small is a problem as well. Uh, so the it looks like the debris all goes back up into the collection bin. How do you, how do you deal with that collection bin? I, I assume you go back to a port and you dock and you recharge your batteries. Does the operator just go climb down a ladder, grab that bin, and throw it over his shoulder and go up and dump it, or how does that work? Oh uh, no, it's it was in the um, it, it was in the mechanism video. Um, so there are bin guides attached to the frame, along with the collection bin also has wheels. So once the arms are fully extended, there'll oh, be there'll be there'll be there'll be slots on the side where you, it will it will be able to roll off. Okay, I got so you. That they just need sense. to they just need to disconnect the cables that are attaching those bin that that okay. that bin to the frame. That's great. I, I'm sorry, I missed that. And, uh, and one last question too, uh, you know, in the harbor, you know, when you're working around the docks, that's one thing, but if you get in around where the boats, you know, where the slips are and the boats, you're going to be bumping into, you know, half a million dollar yachts. <laughs> and uh, I would have thought there would have been some padding around the outside of this guy so you don't go scarring up these, these yachts. Or, or are you worrying about that? Or is that just a detail you worry about later? Uh, so we actually wanted to prevent that by adding some sensors that would um, prevent the collision of going into any of the boats. Well, I don't know. I think a wave's coming and you can have a... <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. If I'm, in a, if I'm sitting in an inner tube and I'm sitting next to a ship and a, 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 a boat and then a wave comes up, boy, it's really hard even with flippers on to keep from hitting stuff. But, uh, but maybe that's a detail you'd find later. The, First one is just get this thing to pick up debris and deal with it, and then uh, I guess you can always deal with the environment later. Uh, in terms of that was always a concern about uh, you know here's this big piece of plexiglass and uh, and aluminum and uh, scraping up against boats wasn't going to go over too well. But uh, at first things first, just get it to work, and then and then worry about the problems as they appear. A uh, really nice job, though. I, I really like your presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Professor Mack. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I have one question regarding the requirement 10, stability. Go ahead. I think it's a continuation of your you know, question about the CG location. Have you done any analysis on stability due to the CG location? Something like a metacentric high kind of concept. I know this is pretty stable, you know, shift, but have you done any analysis on that part? Uh, yes, we did when doing the weight table because if the, the vessel was too light, it would be too high with, with uh, the center, the, the stability, it would bring it a lot higher, which would make it un more unstable. So that's why we wanted to add more water so that we can bring the height down and ultimately make it more stable. And also one of our main concerns was capsizing. And I actually did a moments table in Excel and I actually applied uh, some load to the to to the wind force, and it would only it would take about a twenty four mile hour wind to uh, basically roll our vessel. And since our requirement was only five five mile per hour wind, we were okay with that. And one, but there's one thing about the wave. You one of the objective was a five foot wave, wasn't it? Not only wind speed, but the wave. A five foot high wave. Well, by five foot high wave, we mean when the tide comes in, it goes about like when the tide's really big, it brings the level higher. Like, I'm not sure. Five foot tide is what you're saying? Um, um, three to five foot high waves um, from other boats that exist in the pier. It's yeah, you could have tilt uh, your vehicle a little bit. Order. I'm sorry, what was that? The five foot high wave will, you will tilt your vehicle, your ship a little bit further than, you know, what you, when you're in the stable position. But that might be changing your metacentric height due to the bad initial angle of the five foot height. Um. I guess that's not. I still don't understand what I'm asking. 
and I, then you are. I think you have to. The, you've got a five foot wave. The vehicle might be tilted because the water itself isn't level. And so that you might need to take that into oh, account when you look, consider the stability of the vehicle. Right, and they, they have a lot of mass margin. So if during testing it tends to be a little bit unstable, they could add some water as ballast to both lower the vehicle and to help its stability. On the barrels. Uh, I don't think we have a solution to the five foot waves yet, unfortunately. That's the massive wave. I think that, um, that, uh, uh, requirement this type or something. Five foot waves are huge. <laughs> They're pretty big. Yeah. I think that was the next dimension that we put in there. But yeah, I agree with yeah. you. I, I understand. You know, I just wonder. I mean, this is a pretty stable vehicle, very stable vehicle, but. When you're doing something, you know, there's a requirement. I might need to, you might need to consider when you're calculating the stability as well. You cannot just say it's uh, stable enough, so you know, I'm not gonna consider it you know, into that account when you're designing something. That's why I was my, I was asking the question. Thank you. Good job. Right. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I got one question, Mike. We have time. Go ahead. So, so I, I really like everything you guys done. Uh, congratulations. I'm kind of curious, you know, I think this problem is going to get bigger and bigger. Would, what would you change to your design if you had infinite budget? You know, you said, hey, we need to solve this problem at all costs. Would you do something similar to this? Or were there some things you were considering that were, you know, maybe more complicated, a little bit crazier that you steered away from because of budget? Curious if, if there, there were some other unique but maybe, maybe more, uh, but, you know, but could be a, uh, more, you know, would be able to remove a lot more trash that you guys are thinking of. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there actually was one um, pitched at the beginning of the semester uh, due to um, it being probably way over our budget. It was um, having different types of uh, slave boats that would uh, ultimately uh, make a, a loop around the, the pile of trash and ultimately bring that in with the type of cable um, and connect latch onto the other side of the boat. So instead of having that uh, retraction of arms, it would just be a bigger net and a bigger variety of trash being pulled in. Yeah, that's actually where we got the idea for the gate because we originally had like the, the, the arms going out to encircle it. And then they would wrap around, like they would wrap themselves in order to pull themselves in. They would just turn to wrap the coil. Um, and then we're like, okay, well that's pulling it in. Is there another way we can like get something around and pull in? Cause that's kind of the effect we were looking for. Uh, so that's how we went with the extending the arms and then the gate acts as that. So it's a, it, it's a cheaper solution. Um, the other one would also have been way more difficult to try to get done in the year. So another reason why I went this way. No, cool, I like that. I like the the divide and conquer with a lot of little ones. That's cool. Thanks, Dosa. Okay, we, we still have time for another question or two. If so, there are Professor Bachman, how, uh, what's the credit limit on your credit card if you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, show me, are, show, are you me your, show me your design and I'll show you my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> we have a benefactor, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let me congratulate the team on a job well done. Thank you for your presentation. And um, we'll get ready then uh, for the next presentation, uh, which is the CubeSat deorbiting vehicle. We'll start that one in about four minutes. Um, when that team gets it here completely, they can take uh, control of the screen. So um, there are evaluation forms on Qualtrics to be filled out to provide some feedback on the team. Let me put the, the link in the <coughs> chat room. 
And uh, we'll thank everybody for the participation. Uh, we've got two more presentations. The CubeSat deorbiting vehicle will be next. And then following that is the spacecraft attitude and control system, which was a JPL spot project. We'll get started in, in about, well, I guess about two minutes. Turo, I'm not sure what you've got on your screen, but there's something just about where the uh, Aerospace Corporation logo is that's just sort of a black rectangle. Uh, I think that might be the thumbnail video. Let me try minimizing that and see if that goes away. Is it still there? Still there. It's smaller. Well, now it's gone. Okay. All right, it, it was probably that then. Okay. Okay, it is about time. Um, everybody, welcome back to the to the uh, 2020 Expo. Um, our next presentation is the uh, going to be given by the CubeSat deorbiting vehicle team. Um, if you guys are ready, you can take it away. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Lopez. Thank you all for being here today. We are team number 16, the CubeSat deorbiting vehicle team. We are sponsored by the Aerospace Corporation. Our liaison on behalf of the Aerospace Corporation is Edgar Herrera. Our advisor is Robert Dole, and my teammates are Arturo Urbano, Jesus Valadez, and Ricardo de la Cerda. With this, let us begin our presentation. Next slide. So for our agenda today, we will consist of a technical overview for the project, followed by additional requirements and assumptions that are made in order to proceed with the project. We will then go into the deorbiting and capture mechanisms, continue with the electrical portion of the project, and end with a brief summary. Next slide. We begin by introducing the section assigned for the project. I myself was a team lead for the last third of the project, as well as in charge of the deorbiting analysis. Arturo was in charge of the sensors on board for our CubeSat. Jesus was in charge of the deorbiting mechanism. And lastly, Ricardo was in charge of the CubeSat structure model. Next slide. To provide some background on our project, there is a growing problem of space debris within the lower or orbit, or LEO for short. LEO consists from 200 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. The debris found in LEO consists of miscellaneous launch hardware, spent booster stages, satellite debris, and other decommissioned CubeSats. For the purpose of this project, we will be looking solely at capturing decommissioned CubeSats. Next slide. To add more context, Aerospace's overall project is to have a 3U CubeSat that is able to identify decommissioned CubeSats, navigate towards them, capture, and deorbit the debris. The overall project is split into two, and we were tasked with using 1.5U of the 3U to house a capture mechanism and create a deorbiting mechanism. 
these mechanisms should be able to capture, secure, verify capture, and deorbit using solely aerodynamic drag. We were also tasked with prototyping a CubeSat that will be tested on a customer supplied test bed. Next slide. I will now pass it on to Ricardo with the additional requirements. Now I am going to talk about the requirements for this project. These are requirements that were established by our customer. The total weight for the CubeSat was set to weigh less than two kilograms and this would have been verified through testing. Our power constraints were limited to only 20% of 4,900 milliamps per hour. Our method of verification would have been through testing and analysis. The capturing range must be greater than 30 centimeters and we would have verified this through testing. The capture mechanism must be able to capture the debris and send a signal to ground station to verify the CubeSat is secured and ready to move on to the next step. We would have verified this through testing. The maximum dimensions that we were entitled to were 15 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and we would have verified this through inspection. Our method of deorbiting must be through aerodynamic drag. Once the CubeSat is ready to deorbit, ground station will send a signal to the CubeSat to begin the deorbiting process. We, will have, we would have verified this through testing. The deorbit lifetime should be less than 25 years, and this would have been verified through testing. Next slide, please. I will now talk about the assumptions for this project. We were assuming the CubeSat already has an existing propulsion system. This propulsion system will not be, will not be used for the deorbiting process. The CubeSat will be operational at low Earth orbit, which ranges from 200 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. The air density that will be used will be at mean temperature. The maximum debris size we are targeting will be a 6U CubeSat the maximum debris weight we are targeting will be eight kilograms and there will be a non-lifting reentry. The, the design that we went with for our CubeSat was a standard design that used guidelines from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. The CubeSat structure was designed to be compatible with the V-Pod. The rails are necessary for this design so when the CubeSat is being ejected into space, the CubeSat will not jam with the V-Pod. Therefore, it is necessary that these rails are smooth and the edges are rounded to a minimum radius of one millimeter. We designed each one U cube set separately to stack on top of each other and form a three U cube set. The cube set design also includes shelf cutouts for each one U cube set. These shelf cutouts were implemented to mount any hardware. Next slide, please. I will now talk about the schedule for the spring semester. As we can see from the schedule, the main components for this project, which consisted of the deorbiting mechanism, verification system, power distribution system, and the power and the capture mechanism were being fabricated up until March 8th. Unfortunately, fabrication ceased due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We were in the process of 3D printing our 3U CubeSat model, but the school was shut down and we no longer had access to the school 3D printer. We also lost access to our test bed and we were no longer able to purchase any hardware because we lost access to our budget. Next slide, please. I will now pass it on to Jimmy and Asu so they can talk more about the deorbit mechanism. Thank you. Before we began to design our deorbiting mechanism, we first had to know what our target altitude within LEO would be and how large of a surface area we would need for our deployment system. Using orbital mechanic equations, I plotted the graph on the right the graph on the right shows the minimum required surface area at the corresponding altitude in order to deorbit within the 25 year requirement. For example, if you take a look at the red line, if our CubeSat successfully captures a 2U CubeSat at 1000 kilometers, then we would need a minimum surface area of 15 meters squared in order to deorbit with the debris within the 25 year lifetime. Next slide. With this in mind, we decided to go with a panel design. There were two different panel designs that we were considering, the side panel design or a top panel design with the sheet expanding from panel to panel. As you can see, the side panel design and the baseline curves are nearly identical. However, the top panel design allows for the captured debris to be captured at an additional 175 kilometers higher than no deorbiting mechanism or a side panel design. It also provides an 87 to 94% to lifetime reduction for the debris. Next slide. I will now pass it over to Jesus. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. So now moving on to the deorbiting panel design. 
to be able to deorbit the CubeSat from lower Earth orbit, orbit, excuse me, we designed four equal panels with an area of 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters and a thickness of about three tenths of a centimeter. These four panels will be held in place against the 3U CubeSat using solenoid latches. When it is time for deorbiting, the solenoid latches will unlock and release these four panels, which will be actuated via torsion spring hinges. And these panels will rotate 90 degrees and will assume the position shown in the following figure. There will also be stops placed on the CubeSat to ensure the panels do not exceed the 90 degree rotation. Additionally, these four panels will be connected with a durable, flexible cloth, which will allow for a greater surface area. Next slide, please. And here is a torsion spring calculation. In order for these panels to be lifted into place, torsion springs will be utilized. The torsion springs were chosen based on its simplicity since they do not require any power to function. Calculations have been done to find the minimum required spring constant value that will successfully lift these panels up in the desired position. To solve for this spring constant value, certain properties had to be identified and solved for. As you can see in the following calculations, we went ahead and solved for mass, which must be known in order to solve for the mass moment of inertia of the panels. So in order to find the spring constant value of these torsion springs, we applied the conservation of energy. So when the panels are held in place by the solenoid latches, the springs are packed with potential energy, which is then converted into kinetic energy once the panels have been released. Knowing this, we can then perform some algebra and solve for our spring constant KT. So now this formula of spring constant KT, we can find its value based on angular velocity alone. Next slide, please. Here we have different spring constant values based on different values of angular velocity. And of course, these angular velocity values are based on different time intervals. For example, if we wanted the panels to open up in half a second, the corresponding angular velocity value will be 3.14 radians per second, which will then give us the value for the spring constant KT. This same procedure will then be done for any time interval desired. Next slide, please. Moving on to the aerodynamic drag analysis, we performed a deflection test on the primary structural design, which is the rib panel. This rib panel is of our main concern when dealing with the orbit since it is the main component that is responsible for holding everything up. Aerodynamic drag force is negligible until about 150 kilometers during reentry at which point the panels experience about one-tenth of a Newton force. Given this relatively low amount of force, we decided to test our panel design by applying one Newton of force. At this amount of force, the panel, which is made of the material 2024 aluminum alloy, experiences a maximum deflection of 0.34 millimeters, which was acceptable in our design for the orbit. It is important to note that within the scope of this project, we consider a successful deorbit once a CubeSat with debris has entered within the 600 kilometer range. Next slide, please. We will now move on to discuss the capture mechanism. Here is our preliminary magnetic capture design. As shown in the following figure, the blue square marks represent where the magnets will be placed. These magnets will be set to protrude out of the CubeSat rather than lay flush. These magnets will be housed with protective plastic stoppers to prevent the magnets from cracking or shattering when capturing the debris. Unfortunately, not much progress was made to complete the magnetic capture for testing due to the recent pandemic outbreak. Next slide. And now I would pass it on to Jimmy to discuss a little more about the magnetic capture. Thank you. With the capture mechanism, we had hoped to create a standardized house, housing in order to house the magnet. The standardized housing would have had a male and female connection that would snap together once they came into close proximity. The image on the left are the neodymium magnets we plan to use for this capture mechanism. One concern that has been taken into account was the effect 
was the effect of the magnets on the onboard electronic components. We verified the magnets would not pose a problem to the onboard components. Taking a look at the graph on the right, you can see the attraction force will begin at one inch. Once the attraction force is felt by the CubeSats, they would snap together. Once the, cube, once the magnets have snapped together, the CubeSats will experience a strong enough attraction force such that they will not be able to separate on their own, even with the magnetic stoppers as stated earlier. Next slide. I will now be passing it on to Arturo for the electrical component. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, so here we have the microcontroller capture and deorbing sequence. The microcontroller we used for our project was a TNC 4.0 board, which can be programmed using the Arduino IDE. We imagine this sequence to begin once our unit system has detected a debris and prompts the magnetic capture mechanism. Once our system has confirmed that debris has been captured through the use of our sensors, we wait for the debris to be secured Afterwards, we would then initiate our deorbiting mechanism in which the panels will be deployed. These are the sensors we implemented into our design. The time of flight sensor uses, utilizes infrared light to measure distance. We use the sensor in our system to determine how far a CubeSat unit is from the target debris. This was optimal for our system because we worked under the assumption that our CubeSat already had a LiDAR sensor as a part of our sister project which would locate debris in space, but had a blind spot of about 30 centimeters, which we were required to fill in. These distance values were fed to our microcontroller and provided our system with the information required to, to begin capture, as well as determine that the capture has been successful. The linear Hall effect sensor is a device that is used to measure the, magnetic, the magnitude of a magnetic field. Its output voltage is directly proportional to the magnetic field strength through it. Within our capture mechanism, we desired to utilize magnets to both capture and secure the target debris. Linear Hall effect sensor would output a voltage value that we could read with our microcontroller and determine when the unit is approaching the debris as well as when the debris has been captured. Uh, the next slide will be covered, cover the electrical diagram presented by Jimmy. Thank you. The diagrams below show the power distribution and the communication between the microcontroller and their components. On the left side, we have a top level design. We have a battery pack that will be shared by both projects of the CubeSats. This, pro this battery will then feed power into the buck converters that will step down the voltages to the desired voltages for the components. The microcontroller itself runs on 3.3 volts, the time of flight sensor runs on 2.8 volts, and the Hall effect sensor re receives power from the microcontroller. The solenoid latch, on the other hand, is in different configuration. The five volts will be routed to a MOSFET, which will act as a switch. Once the MOSFET is triggered by the microcontroller, it will close the switch and supply power to a solenoid to disengage the latch for the deorbiting system. Now the figure over on the right is a more detailed schematic on how all the components will be wired. Next slide. I'll now pass it on to Arturo for the summary. Uh, our team successfully designed a deorbiting system that withstands the aerodynamic drag upon re-entry back to Earth. We were able to develop a preliminary capture mechanism that captures and secures CubeSat debris should they have the magnetic capture capability. Utilizing our sensors, the system could both detect the debris as well as verify its capture. Lastly, we were able to design the electrical circuit that provides power and control to our capture and deorbiting mechanisms. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we were unable to complete the fabri fabrication of our system nor were we able to conduct simulations on the air test bed as we had anticipated. Uh, we just want to say thank you to our advisor, Robert Dole, as well as our liaison, Edgar Herrera, for the guidance and support they provided us during this project. Are there any questions? Okay, well, thank you, team. Um, are there questions? Uh, first off, I'd like to mention that the, uh, uh, they did a great job considering the adversity uh, that we started out with five team members and the major, major part of this design was mechanical, but we lost one of the team members uh, uh, at the start of the uh, second you know, semester. So, uh, so they were limited, on, I guess, on some of the you know, mechanical work, but they did, did a great job in, in, in uh, coming together and, and finishing the project. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Edgar, did you have a question? Yeah, question uh, Question online. 
You know, first off, uh, thanks to to you folks, and, and this is Edgar Herrera uh, from Aerospace. Uh, you know, thanks to the team, you know, for all their efforts that they put into this. Uh, there was a lot of hard work uh, that I think showed in the uh, presentation that you guys just provided. You know, uh, in one of your charts, you showed, you know, a magnet on the debris. Uh, so what general recommendation do you have to CubeSat builders to allow your system to work effectively? Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, and if you can back up maybe a couple charts, uh, you you showed you showed a magnet on the debris portion, right? So that that assumes that you know the cubesats uh, uh, going out there um, have to have this magnet on there. The cubesats are generally uh, uh, either that or have some kind of you know ferrous uh, material on there. Yeah, they're generally uh, composites and and uh, aluminum alloys. Uh, so, you know, the system hinges a lot on having uh, a magnet or, or like some piece of iron, you know, such that we can create that attraction between them. So I think there's a, a, a general recommendation that we have coming out of here to CubeSat builders uh, um, to essentially have, you know, this, this uh, uh, um, you know, interface uh, on their systems. Uh, can you just, uh, um, I mean, is that kind of the general recommendation coming out of here? Yeah, so with this project, we had hoped to create a standardized uh, housing so that any CubeSat builder could use. So in hopes of if they use it with this CubeSat, we'd be able to go out and capture it. Uh, however, because of this uh, pre preliminary design, there isn't a full uh, standardized housing that we can, you know, let out into uh, the public for other CubeSat builders. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Oh, this is Ted Nye. Let me follow up on that question just a little bit too, because if these are, uh, you know, the magnets, uh, have you thought about how they'll interact with the Earth's magnetic field? I mean, that's typically how we steer spacecraft is turn on magnets and uh, and it spins the spacecraft around to points in certain certain directions. So it's a great attitude control device, but uh, but here it may have unintended consequences. Was that kind of in your thinking too, or uh, how it might it might it might tumble the spacecraft when when those magnets interact with the Earth's magnetic field? Uh, thank you for that. That is something that we didn't take into consideration. Uh, we probably have to do some calculations to figure out if the Earth's magnetic uh, strength is strong enough to affect these magnets, but uh, we'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. When I'm designing stuff, I'm always amazed by how much stuff comes out of surprising me with it. if it's not vacuum, it's thermal, it's something else. Uh, and these could be electromagnets, so they could be non-magnetic until you energize them, and they could be energized in such a way that you're orthogonal to the Earth's magnetic field, or you may be in an orbit that the Earth's magnetic field doesn't affect. And that's, there's a lot of, there's some mission operations things around it too, but, uh, but yeah, we've been bit by, uh, <laughs> by magnetic, in fact, even wiring solar rays, power going through solar rays, you know, generates magnetic field. So we, we put in the wires so they cancel each other out. They cancel out the magnetic moments on the spacecraft. But it's amazing how much little force it takes to spin a spacecraft in orbit and, uh, and magnetics are a good way to do it. The very first CubeSats had magnetics uh, because they, well, the very first ones didn't and they tumbled. So they thought, hey, let's throw in some magnets. And that's what kept the spacecraft from tumbling. It didn't point very well, but it kept it from tumbling in the early days, it's the uh, 90s. But, uh, but anyway, I, I plenty of presentation. I think you guys did a real methodical job here. And I think uh, a lot of neat, uh, a lot of neat concepts uh, embedded in this thing. So I, I thought you did a really nice job. Thank you for that. Thank you. Hey, can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. So, um, so I like the idea of the magnets. I just was wondering if you guys thought of any other way to grab, um, uh, uh you know, a CubeSat out in space, or was was magnets the first choice? Um, yeah, we did have some other design options. Um, at first, we were uh, planning for some sort of like a extension arm 
But uh, given the the space that we had to work with, it was it proved to be a little more difficult than we expected. And yeah, so we just kind of had to adjust and figure out uh, a way to try to capture something and take up as less space in the cube set, especially since we're only working with 1.5U and um, and there's other components that need to be placed in the cube set as well. So yeah, the, the magnets was not our first choice, but you know, when, when you're designing something, uh, certain barriers you come across and you just kind of, just kind of adapt to them. And so, yeah, we just went with the magnets. Yeah. Really clever. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If not, well, um, congratulations team on a, on a job well done, um, under difficult circumstances. And, um, for everybody in the audience, we've got a few minutes before the next presentation is scheduled to start. Um, I don't want to start early and because I want, especially this one has an external client that may be trying to call in. So, so take the next 15 minutes and fill out the Qualtrics surveys on the presentations that you've been watching. Um, and we will pick up again in about 15 minutes for the uh, final presentation of Expo 2020. Please don't go anywhere. Thank you. We'll get started in just a moment. Uh, at this point, I guess I want to thank everybody for sticking around. Um, this will be the last presentation in the expo this year. Obviously, the format was something that we we put together um, pretty quickly. Um, the but I think it turned out okay. I, one way or another, though, I'm I'm certainly very interested in any feedback that people have. Um, about it and things that perhaps could have um, been done a little bit better. Any sort of constructive feedback I accept with uh, open arms. Um, you can send me an email in the, there's a spot in the Qualtrics survey where you can just open or provide open comments. Um, any way that works for you works for me. Okay. On Team 17, do you know if uh, Charles or somebody else from JPL might be planning on coming to the presentation? Um, he was invited. Uh, he never confirmed uh, whether he was going to be here or not. So. Okay. I imagine they're working remotely as everybody is. Yeah, I think so. Okay. We'll get started in about two minutes. Okay.
Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody, um, to our our final presentation in the Expo 2020. Um, I want to thank everybody for for hanging in there today. Um, your participation is certainly appreciated. Uh, and so, without any further delay, uh, let me introduce the spacecraft attitude and control system team, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Can I begin? Yes, please. Hello, we are the Spacecraft Attitude and Control System team. I'm Oliver, and today I'll be presenting with Marcus Durrell, Jinping Lin, and Martin Capetti. Uh, next slide, please. I'll be going over background, objective, functional, and performance requirements, and decision criteria. Next slide, please. A spacecraft attitude control system is responsible for controlling the orientation of a spacecraft. The attitude control system is used to point the spacecraft in the desired direction while controlling the spacecraft in three directions, which are referred to as the pitch, roll, and yaw. The attitude control system helps spacecraft perform different tasks such as photographing individual bodies in space or taking precise measurements. Next slide. Uh, the current standard for spacecraft attitude control system is the reaction wheel. A reaction wheel uses the conservation of momentum by rotating at a high angular velocity in one direction. The spacecraft cannot provide any resistance to the reaction wheel, so it spins in the opposite direction. These reaction wheels are placed orthogonally on the pitch, roll, and yaw axis to be able to control the space to be able to control the spacecraft in all directions. The issue with this method is that there are moving components in the system. If there are moving parts used, it means that there is direct contact with these moving components on one another to create motion. In the case of the reaction wheels, bearings are used to reduce friction, but the bearings are still in contact with a rotating shaft, which, which causes damage to the system over time. Next slide, please. The objective of this project is to design an attitude control system that is small scale and solid state, which means that there are no moving parts in the actuator. This improves the mechanical lifetime by limiting, limiting or eliminating wear. The reason for it being small scale is because a small spacecraft are more cost effective compared to bigger spacecraft. A spacecraft that has less mass and takes up less space results in weight savings of, of the mission. Weight savings means saving money since shipping things to space is expensive. Next slide, please. These are the specifics of the envelope size for our actuator. The size restrictions are small but negotiable within reason. If we have a good reason to change it, we can. The torque has to be enough to not only turn itself, but to turn something 10 times its mass. We have a hard limit of five watts, so anything we come up with must account for that. Our design has to be accurate, so starting, stopping, and turning must be manageable. The lifespan of the actuator de design must last at least five years. And, and lastly, the actuator must complete a full rotation in less than 48 hours. Next slide, please. So how did we arrive at our final design? The way in which ideas for the project were eliminated and kept track of was through a decision matrix. The decision matrix allowed for a continued score of findings through the decision criteria. The decision criteria was created to help weigh the importance of certain factors which were required to deliver a suitable design. Next slide, please. An example of an idea we originally had that reacts to magnetism and uses uh, conservation of momentum to control attitude. Uh, next slide, please. And then here's an example of the decision matrix that was used to eliminate ideas such as the reaction sphere and leaving the laser idea to be used as the final design going forward. Since the values for, the, for this design were the highest, the laser ended up as the final design idea. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll be passing it over to Martin now. Good evening, everyone. I'll be talking about the laser, which will cover the concept, initial layout, selection, thermal analysis, and the finalized design. Next slide, please. Uh, before going to the breakdown of the design and its components, I want to quickly go over the concept of this laser actuator. 
So this laser actuator works by transferring the momentum of photons to a dielectric mirror at an angle. With the idea in mind that we need a mirror that will be able to angle itself, and with that correct angle, the mirrors are able to reflect the photons out of the system. This will generate a force. Therefore, in the envelope, when we place two lasers on opposite ends and positioning a mirror in front of the laser, we would create couple moments and be able to maximize the torque needed to spin the spacecraft. But with this layout, we only have one degree of freedom and three degrees of freedom is the requirement. Next slide, please. So initially, we wanted six lasers and six mirrors to achieve three degrees of freedom, roll, pitch, and yaw. But there were too many interferences with this model. So then we developed the second design, which consisted of four lasers and four mirrors, requiring to uh, combine orientations. So for example, if the user wanted to achieve pitch, it would require the actuator to combine roll and yaw. Uh, so this was a great design because the lasers and mirrors weren't interfering with each other and had a clear path for the photons to leave the system. Uh, but this was just a preliminary decision. We still have to find the right lasers and mirrors. Next slide, please. So there are two main components uh, in the system, which are the lasers and mirrors. Starting off with the lasers, I found three candidates that could possibly fit in our size constraint, which were the nine millimeter, 5.6 and 3.8 millimeter laser diode. Uh, the labeled sizes just indicate that the largest base plate diameter, uh, it just represents the diameter of the laser diode. Um, so while I was designing our constraint and trying to fit that nine millimeter diode, I just realized that it took up too much space and it was interfering with other components. And although the 3.2 millimeter diode was small, the output power we were looking for was at least 250 milliwatts based on the calculations we did last semester to achieve one rotations within 48 hours. But this laser diode could only provide 150 milliwatts. So therefore we went with the 5.6 laser diode. Next slide, please. And then we also wanted to ensure that when the laser diode was sent out to space and it was operating, that it would and runs continuously for 10 minutes, the laser wouldn't overheat and it would stay within the operating temperature, which was negative 10 to 50 degrees Celsius. So we've decided to do a thermal analysis to check the temperature of the laser diode using ANSYS. But before we could jump into simulating our conditions, we wanted to verify that ANSYS was simulating correctly. So first we simulated Earth's condition, gave necessary materials to the laser diode, as well as the boundary conditions. And I also contacted a company to inquire about temperatures they were reaching when supplying 0.782 watts for 10 minutes. And they said it was roughly 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And when we ran our simulation, we achieved 24 degrees Celsius. And we were satisfied to move forward with the simulation and this time simulating space. Once again, materials were properly set with the similar boundary conditions, but this time removing convection. During the first few trials, the laser diode was overheating way too quickly, getting temperatures above the operating temperature. Uh, that's why we added a heat sink to this laser diode until we achieved temperatures between negative 10 to 50 degrees Celsius based on the operating temperature specifications. And then finally, when pushing, when pulsing at 10 minutes, we achieved a temperature of 10.5 degrees Celsius, which was well within the operating temperature shown, shown on the left picture. And then when we turn off the power supply to cool off the laser, we achieve 2.4 degrees Celsius and will continue to decrease, shown on the picture on the right. And to prevent the laser diode from going below its storage temperature, we do recommend pulsing the laser. So it will require that the mirrors are directly facing the lasers so that the photons do not leave the system and thus keeping the system stable. Uh, next slide, please. Due to additional heat sink, there is a third design, which is this one, our final design. This time, there's only two lasers and two mirrors with an overall dimension of 27 by 20 by 10 millimeters, weighing about 10 grams with four photon 
exit holes. To fulfill three degrees of freedom, we're going to require three envelopes for this design and place on three axes of a spacecraft. Next slide, please. So this is what I mean by placing the envelopes on three axes. This is just a one new cube set and the actuators will be placed on the X, Y, Z axis and it will generate the three degrees of freedom requirement. Next slide, please. Now I'll be passing it on to Jin Ping to present the mirrors and vibrational analysis. Thank you, Martin. Hi, everyone. I will first begin going over the design approach for the mirrors. Um, there are, next slide. There are many mirror. There are many types of mirrors out in the market, but we need a specific type of mirrors that can fit into our small scale design. This type of mirrors is called MEMS mirrors. MEMS mirrors are miniature electromagnetic mirrors that are usually used in MEMS technology. As we can see from this table. There are three types of MEMS mirrors. There are electrostatic, piezoelectric, and electromagnetic mirrors. The reasons that we picked MEMS mirrors are due to its small, small size and its tilting capabilities. According to the table, all three types of mirrors can create optical deflection angles. However, only piezoelectric and electromagnetic are the two that create the largest optical deflection angles among the three. Piezoelectric requires a high power consumption, and the optical deflection angle for linear mode is difficult to control, whereas the electromagnetic only requires around 5 volts. Therefore, we decided to go with the electromagnetic mirrors. Next slide, please. So how do MEMS electromagnetic mirror work? Um, a MEMS mirror consists of two components, a mirror chip and a magnet. The mirror chip then consists of three components, a mirror, coil, and torsion bars, which utilizes a small yet powerful magnet that creates an optimal magnetic field to the coil around the mirror. This results in a Lorentz force that drives the mirror to tilt, which we can see on the picture to the right. Now that we, can, now that we know how MEMS mirror works, we, uh, we will look into different type of MEMS mirrors. In this case, we have two. There's the single axis one-dimensional MEMS mirror, and the other being is the dual axis two-dimensional MEMS mirror. We found two manufacturers that produce these type of um, mirrors, and they all create different mechanical deflection angles, as we can see in this um, table below. Um, the mechanical deflection angle can be seen from the figure above the table, um, is the angle at which the mirror tilts. Next slide, please. On this slide, you, can, you all can see that there are two types of mirrors. There is the flat mirror and there is the triangular prism mirror. The flat mirror is the traditional mirror that is typically on the design mentioned in the previous slide. However, we want to use the triangular prism mirror, which can be seen on the right. The reason that we decided to go with this mirror design is that it is easier to control and because the sides are slanted at an angle, it creates a larger optical deflection angle. This can be seen when both designed with the mechanical deflection angle of four degrees, the flat mirror resulted in an optical deflection angle of eight degrees, whereas the triangular mirror produces a 46 degree, which increased our performance. Hence why we choose this design. Next slide, please. Now I will be going over the vibration analysis for our system. Next slide. A vibrational, a vibrational analysis is important for our system because we do not want our system to be destroyed by the vibrational frequencies of the rocket. The way to get the CubeSat into, the spa into space is for a rocket to bring it up. When this rocket is being launched, it has many vibrational frequencies. For our control system to withstand the vibrational frequencies of the rocket, its natural frequency must be either greater than or less than the rocket's vibrational frequencies. In order for us to determine this information, a rocket must be chosen. Oh, chosen. Um, using the data sheet on the Falcon 9 by SpaceX, its highest 
vibrational frequency is about 6,500 hertz, which we can see um, on the graph. More quick, yeah. Um, now, now knowing the highest vibrational frequencies, um, we can move on to material selection. Next slide, please. So um, we gather common type of materials that are used in space systems. With its material properties and dimensions from our design, the outcome of all the natural frequencies are way above 6,500 hertz. Therefore, all of these materials are suitable for our control systems. Now I will pass it on to Marcus who will talk about the model. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so first, I'll be going over the main aspects that are taken into consideration. Uh, first, we take into consideration the input power and the output power of the laser uh, because we want to make sure for the input power that we don't go over five watts. And the output power is important because that's where we get the momentum of the photons from the laser. Uh, that value will ultimately lead us to derive the amount of torque we get from the lasers. The inertial frame of the spacecraft is next. and that's also important to consider in order to calculate how the spacecraft dimensions will interact with the forces from the actuator. And so it's important to know both of those because the acceleration is found by dividing the uh, torque by the moment of inertia of the spacecraft. And finally, the thermal analysis is important to take into consideration because it's a uh, limiting factor in our design. So we can't, uh, it's, it's what controls our uh, performance. Next, we'll go over the assumptions that we took into account. Uh, the first main assumption is that we are in deep space, so there's no uh, external forces acting on the spacecraft. So we didn't uh, consider wind or gravitational forces or, uh, or friction. So uh, next, we have the assumption of a 1U CubeSat with uniform mass distribution. Um, this, this simplifies the model and it also, uh, because we're not designing for a uh, specific uh, spacecraft or a specific mission, um, it helps us just to uh, find a real world application for our, for our model. So the control system for the uh, actuator will use uh, basic rotational kinematics. The two main conditions that the control system checks for are uh, angular velocity and angular error, meaning the distance between the desired angle and the current angle. So the, uh, basically how our control system works is by uh, first establishing the error percentage between the current angle and the desired angle. Uh, it should start off at 100% error and it should assume that the initial velocity is zero or close enough to zero. Um, the actuator then begins by uh, powering on the laser and tilting the mirrors in the proper directions to generate torque. And uh, so next to prevent overheating, we decided that a scheme of pulsing the laser on for 10 minutes and off for 10 minutes to cool itself down was uh, efficient enough. So next, uh, as it's going along, the, the system is going to check if it has a greater rotation than, half, than the halfway point or uh, less. And if it's greater than, the mirrors will switch to the opposite direction. So it'll, be, it'll begin to accelerate in the negative direction. Uh, the idea here is to slow down the, uh, the actuator by accelerating in the negative direction for as long as it accelerated in the positive direction. So by the time that it reaches the desired angle, the uh, ang angular velocity should be low enough that it's considered zero by our tolerance and the error percentage should be under the given tolerance. And at this point, the system will turn itself off. So uh, these results display a 180 degree rotation on one axis for the actuator. Uh, first, the angular acceleration plot shows that the laser pulses on and off for 10 minutes at a time, as we said before. Um, also, we see that uh, we can't control the, the, in, the uh, output power of the laser or the acceleration. So that's what makes it harder to control. We can't get like fine tuning. We have to have either on all the way or off all the way or on in a negative direction. Uh, so next we have the error plot, which shows a smooth curve, uh, demonstrating that the error went from 100% to under 1% in just under five and a half hours. So that's well within our uh, given time parameter of 48. Um, that's not a full rotation, but if you were to double this time, 
it would still be well within, well within our uh, time parameter. So finally, we have the angular velocity plot, which shows that the actuator doesn't lose velocity when the laser powers off. It simply stays at the same speed uh, due to there being no external forces on it, like friction uh, to slow it down. Uh, but these results all show that the uh, system performs well within the, the given uh, time parameters and it doesn't overheat. So in conclusion, we were able to complete our deliverables on schedule. Uh, we managed to stay under the power budget. We kept the actuator completely solid state, uh, which means no moving parts. We developed an actuator that performed well within the given time parameters, and we were able to deliver our mathematical model. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge our advisor, Xavier, for helping us along for these past two semesters and being very patient with us. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Charles Dandino, for uh, giving us this, this interesting problem and also clarifying things for us and helping us along the way too. And last, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Thorburn for helping us as well with our project whenever we need it and keeping an open door. So are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, we have all the time in the world for questions. <laughs> this was the last project, so so um, just line up in here. Uh, first person first, uh, please uh, unmute yourselves and. All right, so this is uh, Ted. Now I've got a, I got a handful of questions. You're a really interesting project and really good work guys. I, I, liked, uh, I liked everything you did. Uh, when we do the simulations, you're, you're simulating, and, I, and, I, and this is probably, uh, somehow I might have missed it, but you're simulating the dynamics of the mirror or you're simulating dynamics of the spacecraft? Uh, we're simulating the dynamics of the spacecraft. We're basically assuming that the, uh, the mirror is, is being controlled by a control system. So whenever it, it tilts into a, in the opposite direction, we just say it's negative angular acceleration. Okay. And we just assume that it's a zero disturbance environment. So we don't worry about magnetics or solar or in any Correct. Like that. Oh, that we, we try to simplify it as much as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. So when you're looking at that smaller rate, is there a is there an IMU that'll work at those dimensions that can pick up those kind of small rates, or that's a problem for Charles or somebody to worry about? IMU. Oh, well, inertial oh. measurement unit, so that can detect. You know, when you're actually moving, you guys are getting truth in your simulation, but in reality, you know, there's an instrument that has to be able to detect. Hey, the satellite actually rotated a little bit. And sometimes they can't they can't measure that small for that uh, in that small of size anymore. You have to have something real fancy to do that. But it doesn't sound like we were worried about that too much either. No, oh, the yeah. sensors weren't part of our problem. Part of problem. Okay, that makes sense. That's, so that's that's good. I mean, that's just one more complication to worry about. And then uh, let's see. We saw the sound pressure levels inside the. Uh, inside the Falcon uh, rocket. Those actually look kind of low to me, but I think, you know, I haven't worked with the Falcon before. Is that while the CubeSat is inside the dispenser? So it's actually a, a volume inside the dispenser, which is inside you know, a cavity on the spacecraft, which is inside the fairing? Or is that, uh, is that what you actually get when you look at the user's manual for the rocket? Um, the CubeSat will just be inside the rocket. We don't know where it will be placed. Oh. Yeah, we were that just- was from, oh, sorry. That was from the, uh, the uh, user's manual from the-, from the user, That yeah. was okay. the only information that they listed. Well, it's pretty, pretty low, but maybe that's their, that's their design with all the engines and stuff that they have. I've, you know, I've usually seen it up in the high 160s, uh, even, even higher. But, uh, but I, so I was just kind of curious about that. And then we, we chose a uh, laser 400, I think you're in the UV range, is that right? You're in the 400 nanometer or something like that? Yes, 405 nanometers. Yeah, and that's, that, that's primarily, in there, and they look like they're half a watt kind of numbers. And those are primarily, that's all you could find, I guess, of those scales and those dimensions. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering if there could be a higher powered laser that's rated for vacuum, but you just pulse it at much more uh, uh, generous intervals. So you Yeah, we'll probably, yeah. We'll probably pulse it more if it had a higher range of power. I see. So, yeah. So, I mean, you can pulse for seconds, you know, boom, boom, right. boom, right. Uh, but that, so this laser that you actually got, you did a, you did a really good thermal analysis. That's always the first question on laser diodes. Can they survive in the vacuum with just uh, heat conduction? 
And uh, uh, so this one is vacuum rated and is space rated. Is it already is it already flown? Do you know or? So basically, how I simulated the space is just basically the temperature and the so there was no convection at all too, and everything all around it was radiation. Mm -hmm. So that's how I simply simulated it in ANSYS. Oh, so you didn't even, you didn't even rely on conduction then? You're looking at just uh, radiation heat transfer to the... Uh, I assumed, because I did transient thermal analysis, I assumed that it would uh, conduct like automatically itself. The, so basically the objects conduct differently within that simulation already. Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot more complex. Um, yeah. Usually for the parts inside the vehicle, we don't even worry too much about radiation. It's all conduction and, uh, and out to a surface where we, then we can radiate it. So at the vehicle level, it's radiation, but inside the vehicle, you see, it's, we're all worried about conduction. Uh, but that's okay. You guys got a good start. Uh, and one other thing, when you're steering the mirrors, uh, I was a little bit surprised on the trade matrix. You went with, uh, instead of piezoelectrics, I think you said something that was difficult to control. Uh, you went with a, uh, it looked like an electromechanical or an Electro uh, electromagnetic approach. Yes. Yes. So the magnetics, uh, even though they're small, you know, we're in a magnetic, we're flying in a magnetic field. Doesn't take much to turn a spacecraft. But I'm, I'm a little bit surprised on the piezoelectrics uh, because they have, you know, super high bandwidth and they're very, very precise with charge that you put on them. Um, right. But that was, that was pretty conclusive in your mind that they were, they were uh, definitely a step down from the uh, electromagnetics, given the given the environment and given the precision control. Um, well, I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat that question again? Sure. So piezoelectrics are typically used for very precise control. We use them on electron mi electron microscope, for instance, for moving samples around, and they're right. and they're uh, and they have very good bandwidth, so they can go super high frequency to static. Which is really mm -hmm. cool, and then they uh, and they they work on taking a charge. So you know you put a charge on them and they just they form. Now they don't have a lot of displacement. That's a downside of them, but we didn't call that out. You said they were difficult to control, and I was a little bit surprised to to see that comment. Uh, if you said they are range limited, you know, in terms of displacement, I said, oh, I can believe that. Uh, whereas oh. the electric, whereas the electromagnetics, uh, you know, they can they can couple into the magnetic field that the vehicle's in, so they can they can give you some um, some disturbances on the vehicle that you didn't expect. And uh, but it didn't look like we kind of looked into that too much. Right. Okay. So. Um according to this chart, when we were doing research on the type of like mirrors that we can use for our system, we went into an, art, um, an article, um, which is one of the manufacturer. They provided this chart um, for us with like um, experiments that they have done with um, uh, the mirrors. Mm -hmm. And they, um, uh, based on their experiment, it was difficult um, to control for the piezoelectric. If you, mm -hmm. um, but, I am not sure exactly um, how difficult or what are the ranges. So I, this is all um, I know about the mirrors. Yeah. Also, I, I, believe, I believe the power, the power consumption might've been a little high too for- Yes, that is also correct. That's why we weren't able to um, pick piezoelectric because we do have like a power limit. Maybe that power uh, use is in the uh, amplifiers, linear amplifiers you use to drive the piezoelectrics. Piezoelectrics themselves are actually incredibly efficient, uh, but the electronics that drive them sometimes aren't. So it could have been uh, the choice of electronics you did uh, you use. You need a really quiet linear amplifiers to drive piezoelectrics, and those can be very power. Uh, it can be seventy percent efficient, sixty percent efficient. Uh, uh, in their power conversion. So that might have been where the power was going. But uh, uh, but I suspect in this case, uh, you know, you kind of trust the supplier a little bit and, uh, mm -hmm. and you kind of go with it. It's a good start. I think as, you know, you peel the onion back and you start looking at it more, uh, particularly with uh, with coupling into the disturbances on the vehicle, the magnetic disturbances, you may say, oh, geez, I think a non-magnetic approach may be cleaner. Uh, but but it's it all uh, depends where this goes. But I, I, you know, big picture, I think what you guys do is terrific. 
we're not going to worry about the laser beams coming out and hitting other things. I don't think uh, they're they're UV. So, but I think that's a detail that somebody worries about later. Uh, but I think he did a really nice job, and it's it is really a it, uh, a uh, very innovative uh, way to do the steering on the spacecraft. So I thought it was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ted, was that all your questions? Uh, yeah, that's I, it for me. Thank I you. I have a question uh, sure. on the vibration analysis. Um, did you look at pyro shock? I mean, you can get high, high levels at over you know ten thousand RPMs. I mean, 10,000 hertz. Um, no, um, we were only told to focus on the vibrational frequency of the rocket and the natural frequency of the materials. Okay. Um, I believe we were only, uh, we're doing this is to simplify like the, um, the problem. <clears throat> Okay, I, I was just wondering because you, you're going to have high levels. You're looking at a uh, was it a natural fre frequency? Uh, you wanted to keep it above uh, six thousand hertz, and you're probably going to have a lot, you know, high high accelerations at uh, at that level. I don't know how the uh, high accelerations will affect the um, affect the mirrors. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, there was a. Yeah, so normally, you would look at one of the things you're you're looking at acoustics. You have the uh, your vibration through the motors are going to be a lower frequency, but you but pyro shock you get when you uh, 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 get rid of, you know eject the the fairing, and so um, uh, that's that's usually looked at. But but that uh, if you weren't you know directed to to look at it, then that's a um, that's another issue. But a very good presentation. Oh, okay. thank, thank you. you. Okay. Other questions? Oh, one, one quick go back. Uh, in the picture, I think you showed us a 1U CubeSat, right? But in, yes, the, but in the requirements, I thought I saw it's 30 centimeters by 30 by 10. So it would be oh, a 9 so that's actually the envelope. rotating mechanism, the envelope, the one that you see on the sides. Uh -huh. So that's going to be attached to the uh, spacecraft and be able to orient the spacecraft. Because um, in other spacecrafts, the main thing that they use are uh, reaction wheels. So we're trying to replace it with something rigid and small design scale. Well, this looks like a, a one U cube set. So it's 10 by 10 by 10, right? Yes. Yeah, but it was it was uh, used to uh, calculate basically oh. the rotations. So it's just like a a parameter, a given, like a given parameter. It's just, a, it, it's just something simple that you pick and say, let's just work on a one U first, and then we'll figure right. out the nine U. Yes. Oh, okay. Since, since we didn't have a mission specific, we right. just chose something we know. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Looks good. Very good. Okay, that's it for me. Okay. Okay, um, well, let me uh, thank the team, congratulate you on a job well done. Um, and I want to thank the audience for hanging in there for the last two weeks. Um, it's, I, think it, I think the event went reasonably well. Um, we had lots of good presentations. Um, and I, at this point, this brings the Expo 2020 to a close. Uh, good luck to the students on their final exams next week. Um, and don't hesitate to call us if you have any questions or, or anything. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good job, guys. Thank you. Good job. Awesome.